Good evening and welcome to the February 6th, 2023 meeting of the Menlo Park Planning Commission. I am Vice Chair Cynthia Harris acting as chair this evening. I will be acting as chair until the new chair has been seated. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for joining us. Sorry, this can you Sorry, thank you for joining us this evening here in council chambers and also on Zoom. It's terrific to see so many people. Um, this is a hybrid meeting with some commissioners and staff in the council chambers and some participating via Zoom. So please bear with us as we continue to work through integrating the those present and uh, those participating online. So to hear to learn how to participate, I'm going to turn to our clerk this evening, um, Matthew Pruder, to explain how you can participate um, and win. Good evening. Uh, Acting Chair Harris, and thank you, Planning Commissioners and members of the public. My name is Matt Pruder, and I'm the clerk this evening. And for tonight's um, meeting, I would like to point out a few things. Uh, first, that we kindly ask that all uh, commissioners have their webcams on for the duration of the meeting. For those who are presenting on an item on tonight's agenda, we kindly ask that you turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item, or if in person to uh, come up to the podium when asked. A member of staff will assign you keyboard and mouse controls if necessary for virtual display of a presentation. For those virtually participating, we also kindly ask that you turn off your webcam and microphone when done with the presentation portion of your item, unless called upon by the chair. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on their Zoom interface, upon which staff will be able to introduce you and activate your microphone. And alternatively, for those calling by phone for tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. And additionally, for any members of the public in person, uh, when um, your item uh, comes up, you're, you're welcome to come up. But to speak, you're welcome to speak in person, but you, uh, we would ask that you provide us with a comment card that's provided in the back of the council chambers. If you could complete that and provide it to the uh, clerk person, uh, myself, um, at this table before the item, that is greatly appreciated. And uh, also, lastly, for any members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter during this meeting, please inform staff at the start of the public comment that you have another commenter on your line, and we will ensure that the other commenter also gets an opportunity to speak following your comment. With that said, I hand it back to you, uh, Chair Harris. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pruder. Um, with that, we call the meeting to order. And next, uh, we turn to agenda item B, which is roll call. So I'd like to call the roll of the commissioners. Commissioner Barnes. Good evening. Commissioner Doe. Present. Commissioner Riggs. Present. Commissioner Schindler. Present. Commissioner Tate. Present. And I'm here as well. So with six members, we have a quorum and we can begin. Uh, I will now turn to Principal Planner Sandmeyer for any reports or announcements this evening. Uh, good evening, uh, Acting Chair Harris and Commissioners. Um, my only update is, as most of you probably know, the housing uh, element was adopted by the um, City Council last Tuesday night. Um, and that concludes my updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does anyone on the commission have any questions for Ms. Sandmeyer? Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yes, thank you. Um, I have a request, if I may, of staff. Um, I don't remember, uh, maybe six months ago, we altered the staff report format such that the introduction to the item is located where the address and applicant used to be. Um, I'd like to request um, at the minimum that the address be provided on a separate line um, or in the case of one of our projects tonight just that the address be provided at all uh, since we missed it I think on uh, 785 Partridge and <clears throat> that um, perhaps we reconsider how much duplication um, we have at the um, 
title of the um, staff report. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sam, or I'm sorry, Ms. Stammer, would you like to um, respond to that or just take that under consideration? Um, yeah, we'll take it under consideration. Um, I will note some of the update has to do with um, trying to be more consistent with city council agendas, um, but we can certainly look at um, look at how we could make it more clear. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, thanks. So we're going to move on to public comment. Under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject that is not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You are not required to provide your name or city of residence, but it's helpful. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. At this time, please raise your hand. Do you have any, do we have any hands raised, Mr. Pruder? Thank you, Acting Chair Harris. At this time, I do not see any hands raised, but I'm happy to wait a moment. And I also do not see at the moment any uh, members of the public in the council chambers interested in speaking on non-agendized items at this time. Okay, let's give it, let's give it one more minute. Still no hands? I still see no hands raised at this time. Okay, thank you. I will now close public comment and move on to item E, the consent calendar. We have three items on the consent calendar for tonight. The minutes from November 3rd and 7th and court report transcripts for both the 123 independence and the park line project discussed on December 12th. Uh, before we ask the commission um, for a motion, I have one question for Ms. Sandmeyer. There was another project on 1212 agenda um, in addition to 123 independence and the park line project. So would we just expect to get minutes for that one at a time in the future? Um, that's my question. Yes, yeah, so the two, um... The two items in the packet are the court reporter transcripts um, and the actual minutes will be um, coming forward at a, at, a, at a meeting in the future. Terrific, thank you. Would anyone on the commission wish to pull uh, one or more of the items from this consent calendar? Okay, seeing no hands, um, would someone like to make a motion to approve the consent calendar? Yes. Okay, I have a first from Commissioner Riggs, and do I have a second? I'll second. I have a second from Commissioner Doe, so let's take a vote. Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Commissioner Barnes? I'm sorry, I must have missed something. Was something directed at me? Um, you're voting on the consent calendar. The consent, yes. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Barnes, Commissioner Doe? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Schindler? Um, I was not present, uh, not yet seated on the November 3rd meeting, um, but I was watching via video, so I'm comfortable approving and voting yes. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Tate? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes, so the motion passes with six, four, and zero against. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, agenda item F, which is a continuation of the study session of the Parkline project discussion we had on the 23rd of January. I'm now going to read the description um, from that meeting, and bear with me, it is lengthy, um, and then we will move on from there. <clears throat> study session for the Parkline Master Plan project to comprehensively redevelop an approximately 63.2 acre site located at 301 and 333 Ravenswood Avenue and 555 and 565 Middlefield Road. 
The proposed project would redevelop SRI International's research campus by creating a new office research and development transit-oriented campus with no net increase in commercial square footage, up to 550 new rental housing units, with a minimum of 15% of the units available for below market rate households, new bicycle and pedestrian connections, and approximately 25 acres of publicly accessible open space. The proposed project would demolish all existing buildings, excluding buildings P, S, and T, which would remain on site and operational by SRI and its tenants. The proposed project would organize land uses generally into two land use districts within the project site, including number one, an approximately 10 acre residential district in the southwestern portion of the project site, and number two, an approximately 53 acre office slash R&D, research and development district, that would comprise the remainder of the project site. In total, the, project, the proposed project would result in a total of approximately 1,898,931 square feet, including approximately 1,380,332 square feet of office R&D and approximately 518,599 square feet of residential uses, including up to 450 rental residential units. In addition, the proposed project would establish a separate parcel of land that is proposed to be leased to an affordable housing developer for the future construction of a 100% affordable housing or special needs project, which would be separately rezoned as part of the proposed project for up to 100 residential units. And this would be in addition to the residential units proposed within the residential district and which is not included in residential square footage calculations as the square footage has not yet been determined. The EIR will study two potential project variants, one that includes an approximately 2 million gallon buried concrete water reservoir and associated facilities, and one that includes an additional 50 residential units for a total of up to 600 dwelling units, inclusive of the standalone affordable housing building. The Planning Commission previously held a public hearing on the scope and content of the EIR as part of the 30-day NOP, that's Notice of Preparation, comment period that ended on January 9, 2023. The project site is zoned C1X, Administrative and Professional District Restrictive, and governed by a Conditional Development Permit, CDP, approved in 1975 and subsequently amended in 1978, 1997, and 2004. The proposed project is anticipated to include the following entitlements, general plan amendment, text and map, zoning ordinance amendment, rezoning, conditional development permit, development agreement, architectural control for potential future design review, heritage tree removal permits, vesting tentative map, below market rate BMR housing agreement, and environmental review. Again, this was continued from the meeting on January 23rd, 2023. Do we have a presentation from staff and or the applicant? I realize that we did have a presentation at our last meeting, but I know we would all value an update and review from both staff and the applicant. So I hand it to you, Ms. Sandmeyer. Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a short presentation. I believe the applicant has one um, as well. Let's see, Vaughn, could you pull up the staff presentation? Thank you. Good evening. So this is a continuation of the Parkline project study session. Um, so the purpose of the meeting is to provide feedback on the project plans. Um, and so I won't be giving an overview of the project. I'll leave that to the applicant and it's also described in the staff report. Um, I can provide a little more background. So the project was originally submitted in October uh, 2021. There was a introductory meeting with the city council in June uh, 2021. And then the city council held uh, the most recent study session on the project on May 10th, 2022. And the planning commission held the EIR scoping session on December 12th, 2022. So there will be no actions taken tonight and the city council will at a future date consider certification of the final EIR and most of the land use entitlements.
Okay, so um, upcoming milestones. So we'll have the a city council meeting to review the uh, notice of preparation comments. Those are on the scope of the environmental impact report. And that's planned for late February or early March. Um, and then we're looking at a release of a draft EIR in the summer or fall of 2023. And while the EIR is being uh, prepared, work will continue on the entitlements for the project. And then we'll have a planning commission uh, public hearing on the draft EIR and uh, likely another study session. And that will be in the fall of 2023. What's it after that, um, there will be additional meetings and opportunities to comment. And this slide shows the study session topics um, that could be discussed. So we have proposed land uses and site density and intensity, site access, including vehicular, pedestrian, and bicycle, architectural styles, design and layout of open space, parking locations and ratios, and proposed sustainability measures. And that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for staff or can we move on? Shall we move on to the presentation by the applicant? Okay, Mr. Murray, go ahead. Thank you. Excuse me, could you pull your microphone a bit closer? How about now? Oh, there we go. So we're just about talking about being brief, but uh, so we really wanted to focus, you know, our, our presentation tonight on, on on trying to be as responsive as we could to, to questions and comments we heard at the last hearing a couple of weeks ago, and then hopefully quickly get to, to any public comment or, or or have more discussion with you uh, to, to kind of finalize the the scope of the of the the CEQA, uh, for the project. And then, can you go to the next slide, please? So hopefully you received a letter from David Preck, the, the CEO of SRI. David is unfortunately unable to attend tonight. He's actually out of town celebrating, which I think is his 40th wedding anniversary. So it, he looks forward to being in person at, at, at the next hearings, but this was a, a, a tough one for him to reschedule. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I, I won't, you know, read his letter in its entirety, but try to do my best to summarize it. Um, I think one of the main points David was making was, you know, how important Menlo Park has been to SRI's history, but vice versa as well. You know, their campus across the street has been the home of a lot of really impactful innovations, but Menlo Park and this location are also mission critical to how SRI sees their future, having access to the best and brightest people, not only to be their direct employers, but to work with partners who can occupy the campus and other co-tenants who ideally will have very kind of like-minded um, research mission oriented uh, goals for their company as well. And I think what David was also trying to emphasize, which we have as well, that, you know, the submittal we have in front of the city now is very much the result of a lot of community outreach and a lot of feedback, but also that that's not the end of the process. We're here tonight to continue listening, continue refining, and hopefully continue to, to approve the project. Uh, next slide, please. And I think the question was asked in a couple of different contexts a couple of weeks ago, like like not just what you're proposing, but but why are you proposing what you're proposing? So we wanted to kind of fill in some of that context, which I don't think we've done a lot uh, to date in, in the prior hearings. But uh, you know, our update and our 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 charge with SRI is to ultimately redevelop redevelop their research and development campus to be a world class research and development facility like it has been for the last 80 years for the next 80 years. Uh, and then part of that, it requires providing to consolidate for SRI, you know, temporarily. And one challenge we have here that, 
you know, is very different from Willow Village and, and basically, I think 99% of any other redevelopments is SRI is working to consolidate, but they actually have to stay and, and be operational on this campus the entire time, which is, you know, it, it's, a, it's a challenge from a design standpoint as well. Next slide, please. So I, I just wanted to briefly walk the commission in, in public as well through, this is a development plan that SRI started uh, in 2012, 2013, Lane Partners wasn't involved, but it was when they, they ultimately didn't proceed with it, but this was what they were looking at in terms of modernizing their campus. So similar to the commercial component of Parkline, you know, it's a one for one redevelopment, taking down some old buildings, retaining some older buildings, uh, doing a one for one replacement. The, the campus would still be secured. So you see green space there, which they're generating, but that would not be publicly available or amenitized green space. Uh, there's a lot of surface parking. You can see from the park line plan that there's very limited surface parking, um, but, but a very different project. But this, we're showing this because this is everything SRI needed for its own purposes before looking at what can we do uh, to improve the community. And one thing I wanna point out here is we've had a lot of comments and questions about is that, electrical substation across the street, is that going away? <laughs> and is the cogeneration plan, which I think is quoted as being responsible for like 11% of carbon generation in, in all of Menlo Park, are those things going away? This plan di didn't, didn't include that. And that's really a cost issue. So we're spending you know, a very significant amount of money on not only redoing the buildings, but redoing all the utility infrastructure for the site to get rid of that cogen to get rid of that substation on Laurel and put housing there. Uh, it's very costly, but it's also, I wanna make very clear, that's not just a byproduct of doing new buildings. It's not something we have to do in order to facilitate new development. It's something we're doing to make, you know, a more beautiful place in, in the example of the substation, but also to have a, you know, we're gonna reduce carbon by over 50%, despite adding, you know, hundreds of, of, of housing units, and, and that's how we're doing it. Next slide, please. And so SRI engaged us to, to kind of say, hey, here's what we need from a baseline. Here's what we need in terms of our, our new research and development campus. But we're, we're open to, you know, adding to that, to doing something that is, you know, a, a lot more beneficial to the community beyond what we need. And I, I, we've talked about these before, but, you know, our guiding principles in the development have opened the campus to the community, create an entirely new housing district, but also make something that emphasizes on the production of affordable housing improve bike and pedestrian transit through and around the site, sustainability and carbon reduction, which I just mentioned, preservation of heritage trees. I mean, the, the heritage trees on the site are, are, are a fantastic amenity that we want to keep. That's also another design challenge. I mean, they really are, if you look at our tree removal plan, it, it's, we went to a lot of painstaking detail, but there's, you know, the site is peppered with, with heritage trees. So it's a real, it's kind of brain surgery to, to go through that, which I think we've done a pretty good job of doing, but Again, when you look at something like Willow Village, where you can kind of start with a clean slate between SRI remaining in place and all the trees, it's a it's a little more challenging that way. But ultimately, the trees will have a huge impact on on being a great environment when when it's complete. And then also just respecting the neighborhood context, uh, listening to neighbors, understanding their concerns with locations of different things, densities, heights, noise, things of that nature. Next slide, please. And so I, I won't I won't be too redundant here, but this this kind of lays out I think the all the benefits of the site that, that are in our last submittal, including 550 units, including a land dedication to an affordable partner, uh, targeting 28 to 30 percent affordable. But a couple of things I wanted to note specifically from what we heard two weeks ago. One, we heard very specifically land dedication is a great idea, you, you, but the location being separate from the rest of the housing was not great. You wanted to see that consolidated. That's not something we're prepared to show tonight. That is something we're committed to doing. So next time we make a formal submittal, you will see that. Uh, we're also looking into increasing the size of the land dedicated to that affordable partner. And therefore, obviously, hopefully increasing the number of units from 80 to 100 to something 100 plus. Uh, again, very preliminary, so we can't say what that'll be, but it will be more. And then lastly, you know, we, uh, from, from talking to housing advocates, from hearing public comment, as well as comments from commissioners, you know, even at the 550, and we talked about studying 700 at, at the December hearing, 
you know, we are willing to study more. We essentially went back and looked at the site and thought about, you know, what is a really maximum feasible density we think we can put in this housing district without undermining the site integrity and things we need for SRI. And the number we're proposing to study, if commission and obviously council is on board of that, is increasing the 700 to 800 in terms of the, the maximum CEQA. And, and to be clear, we're not proposing doing 800 units. That's something where we're going to do a, a lot more study on the site. Uh, our focus is going to be increasing affordability and things like that. Um, but we are willing, we do think it's feasible to do that much. So as we proceed with the CEQA study, we want to give the community kind of a, a wider range, a wider upper limit for housing. So as we progress in, in evaluating the, the project over the next you know, year or more, uh, the city will have the ability to prove that level of housing via the CEQA analysis. And then I just wanted to quickly talk about, I think the question was, you know, why are you at 55 units or why were you at 40 before? When we first got started, you know, there's, there's, the, there's no base zoning for SRI. Actually, it's only commercial use, like residential use is not allowed on the, on the SRI site. So, you know, the baseline zoning didn't give us any, any direction. You know, we have single family homes in one direction. That's obviously not the density we were looking to do. So we really, as a starting point, looked at the densities we saw in, in the downtown specific plan, which I think ranged from about 18 units an acre up to 60. And 60 is the absolute maximum, even with density bonuses and things like that. So we started at 40 units an acre, which felt you know, kind of a moderate place to start. We actually did a series of open houses before even making that initial submittal. And you know, we didn't see anything compelling taking us one way or the other from above or below 400. Now, again, that's not saying everyone said 400 is good. We just heard a lot of voices saying up. A lot of voices saying down. Uh, we then had study sessions with commission and council. Council directed us to study up to 600. So with that guidance, our next submittal was doing 550, but also with the land dedication, taking the affordable up to 28 to, to 30%. And now we were, you know, as of December, we were talking about studying up to 700 units. We are willing to study up to 800 units if, if that's something, uh, again, commission wants to, wants to pursue. Next slide, please. And then, then conversely, while we used, you know, the downtown specific plan as as sort of our our initial guidance for housing, you know, now we're looking at studying well above their maximums. For commercial, we 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 didn't look at that at all. If you just apply the office maximums from the downtown to SRI, you can build like three million feet. That's much more than SRI needs. You know, it'd be a very profitable development, candidly, but didn't feel like it was appropriate. Felt like it was, you know, it's certainly much more space than SRI needed for uh to create their ecosystem so instead you know as we had the commercial hasn't changed we're doing a one-for-one -one re replacement sri is kind of shrinking temporarily into three buildings uh via their consolidation uh we're creating new housing and then you know and, and then one thing we really want to touch on is you know the jobs housing balance and in, in, in new new employees generated by the redevelopment. So for purposes of, you know, there's a very deflated population on the SRI campus right now. I think in, in the heyday in the 80s and 90s, there was, you know, up, up to like 4,000 people. Uh, I think it was at least a couple thousand, you know, in general over the last 10 years or so. SRI has been very actively depopulating that campus um, over the last couple of years, hopefully preparing for, for redevelopment. They're gonna further shrink to 700 people temporarily to fit into the PS and T buildings. Uh, but when we, I think when for terms of, so for things like traffic studies in the EIR, we're gonna be measuring the future density against a, that very low deflated basis of 1100 people. So it's a very conservative approach to things like traffic. But for things like studying, you know, talking about the policy of jobs housing balance and how the city's gonna look at balancing those things over years and decades to come, I really think the appropriate kind of comparison is approving parkline you know with 550 to 800 units and we think there'll be about 4,000 people on campus or leaving the existing campus as is which the population could inflate back to you know i think a conservative utilization would be you know 3,000 people so that's why we're saying if you really compare those two alternatives apples to apples in terms of looking down the road and where will you be in five years you know 800 to a thousand new new employees is is a realistic target. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then there was a lot of discussion about Willow Village. You know, there's some there's some pretty big practical differences between those two. I, I mentioned, you know, we're, we're keeping SRI retained here. We're working around the heritage trees. This is also, you know, unlike Meta, I think they have millions of feet kind of around. They probably have the ability to sort of shift employees in and out of this campus to be able to redevelop. This is SRI's only only campus. This is world headquarters. Uh, they have to stay up and running here, and then they want to make it their long-term home as well. But this is just kind of comparing those numbers. Uh, Willow Village, I think, was pro projected to have 7,000 or more people versus we think it's going to be about 4,000. Uh, new employees, that would be 3,500 versus we're saying 800 to 1,000. But again, that's based on the campus being more fully occupied. Housing units, you know, again, we're, we're willing to study up to 800 now, so 550 to 800 versus the 1,700 there. But again, we're doing a, a higher level of affordable housing. And again, we're hoping with a resubmittal that we will actually take that 30% um, number even higher. Uh, next slide, please. And then lastly, we just wanted to confirm with, with commission, I think, you know, a, a couple of folks asked, where are we? Like, where are we in the process? This is very far from the end. You don't have to make any determinations on what the finished product will look like. We're really asking for two things this evening. One is to kind of crystallize what is the CEQA and EIR scope so that that study can get going. That's a that's a year long plus process. So the one of the big questions is, you know, the 700 units, 800 units. Again, we're willing to study up to 800. So we'd like uh, feedback and direction on that. And then, you know, feedback on the this is a study session as well. So feedback on the project is in, as well in the confines of those ranges. Like a, a great example of that is the feedback we heard about the land dedication. You know, the land dedication is a great idea. The location is not a great idea. Move it into a, a, a better location. That, that, that's, that's great feedback that we can work to synthesize into our next middle. And with that, we can answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. And thank you for coming before us again for the third time on this same agenda item. We will finish it tonight. Um, as you know, we did already take public comment on the 23rd of January, uh, and I was thrilled to see that I think we had over 30 commenters. However, given that there have been updates from the applicant tonight uh, since our last meeting, I would like to go ahead and hold public comment again tonight. I would request that anyone who's interested in commenting to please raise your hand now if you're on Zoom and also take up your comment card to the clerk if you are in the chambers. I'd like to get a sense for how many commenters that we will have tonight. So that would be terrific. And then before we go to public comment on this item, I'd like to ask the commissioners if there are any clarifying questions either for the applicant or for the staff. Commissioner Barnes and Commissioner Tate, I can't actually see you. So unless you, I'm going to assume if I don't hear from you, then you don't have any clarifying questions at this time. I do not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Pruder, can you give us a sense for how many um, folks we have that are interested in speaking this evening? Thank you, Acting Chair Harris. At this time, I see uh, approximately 10 hands raised in Zoom, and I also have received one comment card uh, from a member of the public. So as a reminder, anyone interested in the audience at the Council Chambers this evening that would like to speak publicly on this item, please present a comment card to me at the uh, Planning Commission Clerk desk, and we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, given the numbers, um, I'd like to uh, have everybody limit to two minutes. Mr. Pruder, for two minutes for uh, the commenters? Sure thing. And we can go ahead and um, begin that now. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, I will uh, begin the virtual commenters. Again, those who have raised their hands, uh, the first person I see online at this time goes by the name of Jenny Michelle. I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself, and at this time, you'll have two minutes to speak. Uh, you do not have to state your full information um, in terms of name and address, but uh, you're welcome to do so, and I'll let you speak at this time. Thank you. 
Uh, dear all, I'm Jenny Michelle from the Como Place Neighborhood Block, recovering homeless teacher by trade, a commercial property manager representing landlord interests and a former luxury real estate agent in Menlo Park. While we wait for HCD to review our housing element for substantial compliance, the SRA project is our opportunity to affirmatively further fair housing in action. And I need to come clean. I made a mistake that I need to correct. Although I applauded the applicant for adding additional housing units, I failed to tie our environmental justice element. This project is larger than the Willow Village by several acres of land. Because of the proximity to transit, downtown grocery, medical education, we have the exciting opportunity to increase the density to a comparable level exceeding the 1,730 units that Willow Village is approved for. As many neighbors have mentioned, this is a once in a generation opportunity for resilient growth. And I ask this body and applicant to consider of up to 1,850 units of housing, housing with at least 30% being affordable. 53 acres of land dedicated to office life science R&D product is a massive development. And I appreciate that the applicant SRI has engaged a for-profit stakeholder lane partners, but I ask you, where are your children gonna grow up when they live? Or sorry, where, where are they gonna live when they grow up? Or where are they uh, when they graduate? Where are they going to live? Why do we mandate that our kids must move away from their native land? Why not keep our invested stakeholders, our youth here, continually invested in enriching the city? Uh, in our city with their families. Driving this further, where are the day porters, security guards, admins, technicians, aides, butchers, hairstylists, daycare providers living? What are we doing to ensure that those of us living at entry-level jobs can live and work off this campus? Does the 53 acres solve for this need? It does solve the high yield spread demanded by investors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker uh, is calling by phone, and I will just uh, recite the last four digits ending in 7116. Uh, if you would like, you may provide your name and uh, information regarding your address and location, uh, but I'll let you uh, speak at this time, and you may now unmute yourself. Hi, this is Rob Wellington. I live in the Willows. Uh, I just want to say I really like the housing uh, and the open space that the project's bringing. It's it's badly needed for all the reasons many folks have, have already mentioned. Um, I also think it's really important to have more commercial space in and near the downtown. Downtown retail has always struggled in Menlo Park, and that's due in large part to the lack of lunchtime demand and, and people walking through the streets in the middle of the day. Um, Refuge is a great restaurant that I love that just closed a week or so ago, uh, you know, due to low demand. Other restaurants like Camper no longer offer lunch service at all. Um, so I hope that's something that this project can address. Um, and another thing that I think we need to consider is that uh, Caltrain needs to get their ridership up in order to effectively help mitigate the traffic issues that we have. Um, and I think the the commercial component will will benefit that as well. So it's another reason that uh, I support uh, the commercial component as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is uh, named Pam Jones. Um, I'll allow you to unmute yourself at this time. And again, you'll have two minutes to speak. Thank you very much. If I may, through the chair, I'm sorry. I believe uh, there might have been an error here. Um, I'm going to have, uh, it looks like the account changed when I hit it. So I apologize, but uh, we have someone named Karen Grove, uh, whom I can have unmute at this time. Um, you may begin at this time. Can you hear me? Oh. I think you can. Um, I didn't click unmute, so I just want to pause and see if you can hear me. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so thank you. Um, I really appreciated hearing about the updates to this project. I am really enthusiastic that the 100% affordable housing CAD is going to move into the residential zone. I'm really happy to hear that you're willing to do more than 100 units of deeply affordable housing. That is the type of housing we have the greatest um, hold for. I mean, we have the greatest uh, deficit in 100% deeply affordable housing, especially for people with special needs. And I know that that is under consideration. So I really appreciate that. I think it's paramount. Um, I also really appreciate that you're willing to study at least up to 800 housing units. Um, and that, and I recognize that relative to the maximum occupancy of the site as is, that's a very good almost one-to-one -one, um, balance between job, new jobs and new housing. Um, so much appreciation for that. And just in general, there's so many other things that I really appreciate. I like the open campus that people can bike through um, on behalf of the people in the uh, Burgess Classics. I think it's nice that you're staggering from their neighborhood to two-story townhouses um, to the more dense and higher residential units. It seems very thoughtful to me. Um, and on a personal note, I was a mechanical engineer and I interviewed at SRI and it is a very cool and special place. I remember feeling almost like um, I was in the home of a rock star. Um, so it is a great neighbor and asset for our community. And finally, I was at one of my favorite restaurants on Saturday night in downtown Menlo Park and there were two tables occupied and the rest were open. We need more people to patronize our restaurant um, and keep them in business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker I'll return to uh, is Pam Jones. You may now speak. Good evening, planning commissioners, parkland staff and city staff. This is Pam Jones, resident of Menlo Park District 1. Um, I want to thank you for allowing public hearing again on this item, and I want to thank Parkline for your flexibility in considering additional units and the percentage of affordable units. I woke up this morning with um, the following thoughts. To meet our arena number for affordable housing at all levels, we need to build um, up to 1,662 units. In the approved pipeline projects, there's only 594 affordable units. So we need to concentrate on how to build the maximum number of affordable, affordable units first. And I think it starts with the Parkline Opportunity Site. If we can get this number up to 100 units, we'll begin to be that much closer to our obligation. I realize that 1,000 units is not all going to be affordable. I never imagined I would say this, but if the best way to increase affordable units is to build physically separate projects on separate pieces of land, then that should be the goal. Additionally, the council must rezone to allow a maximum number of units per acre, which should be well over the 100 per acre that has been allowed in District 1. If Parkline SRI will lease the, the additional land on the corner of Ravenswood and Middlefield to get um, this density, um, then I believe that we are a step forward and we can have the maximum number of affordable and for persons living with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is named Ken Chan. I am now allowing you to speak. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the Menlo Park Planning Commission. My name is Ken Chan, and I'm the senior organizer with the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. We work with our communities and their leaders to produce and preserve quality, affordable homes. Uh, I'd first like to thank staff for all of their work on their presentation and the report on the Parkland proposal. And I'd also like to extend our appreciation to both the developer and SRI for their willingness to listen to your community members and to work to improve their proposal based on their comments. Um, on behalf of HLC, I'd like to highlight uh, that the SRI site is situated in an ideal location due to its close proximity to downtown Menlo Park and to the Caltrain Transit Station. Having jobs, whether it be retail or commercial, and homes in transit-rich spaces like this reduces the need for driving and allows for better employment opportunities for your community members who rely on public transit. In addition, uh, the proposed one-acre land dedication to an affordable housing developer will allow for the creation of homes at the deepest levels of affordability, which is greatly needed uh, within your community. With that said, we encourage you to support the proposal that allows for the greatest 
a feasible number of homes, especially uh, affordable ones. This can in turn help your city push back against the um, jobs housing imbalance faced by all of your community members and also provide your most vulnerable residents with a safe and stable place to call home. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is named, uh, I apologize in advance for pronunciation, Michal Bortnik. Uh, you may now speak. Thank you for such a great pronunciation. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Michal Bortnik, and I feel personally vested in this project because I live in a walking distance of Burgess Park and SRI, and I use Ravenswood to get to and from 101. And in a couple of years, my daughters will likely be biking to MA uh, if they're still listening to me by then. Uh, so first, I'd like to appreciate uh, the developer and SRI for being so responsive to community input and uh, in particular being flexible and making such high percentage of uh, units affordable. Um, so I'd like to speak in support of the version of this project that does not make the jobs housing imbalance any worse than it already is. Uh, as we just heard, uh, the project and by the calculation is expected to add 800 to 1,000 employees, so we need to pair it with 800 to 1,000 new homes uh, just to not make things worse. Um, and given the location so close to downtown uh, in transit, uh, I'd love to see us really do everything we can uh, to mitigate uh, the traffic impact as well. Uh, so, uh, in short, I strongly support moving forward with the EIR extended to uh, study up to at least 800 units. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, has the name of Adina Levin. You may now speak. Thank you. Um, good evening, Planning Commissioner. It's Adina Levin, um, Menlo Park resident. I live near uh, downtown. And um, wanted to comment, um, so, so um, uh, wanting to be supportive of the um, uh, evolution of this proposal to have mm -hmm. more homes and more affordable homes. Um, I wanted to report that um, with uh, Menlo together, we've been getting the word out about this site and the opportunities and um, got uh, there are 46 signatures on a letter, the vast majority of whom live in Menlo Park and the others who work or shop or worship or dine in Menlo Park. Um, you know, building off of the comment that the initial proposed zoning was based on the downtown specific plan, a tremendous amount has changed since that plan was done. Immediately when that plan was done, the city turned its attention to do a general plan update, but that really was a specific plan update focusing on the land use in the Bayfront area and had, um, you know, just tremendously greater density in that area that has less transit and less services in that near, near downtown area. And it made sense um, right, right then, and, and I was on the advisory committee there to come back and um, have a uh, a comparable density in the area near downtown that had that transit and had that services. And also uh, like with our most recent housing element and the you know uh, ever greater housing crisis, it is just you know more clear to many more residents than ever before how important it is to provide more homes and more affordable homes at this fantastic location. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the Planning Commission for supporting that direction with more homes and more affordable homes. Thank you very much. Our next speaker uh, is named Connor. You may now speak at this time. Hey, y'all. My name is Connor Flannery, and I'm a corporate real estate advisor who's based here in Menlo Park. I represent all kinds of commercial uses in the city and in the region from office to lab uses. I see this as a fantastic site for commercial use that will help Menlo Park retain and attract the best employers in the world. And we need new projects like this for the region to continue to be a leader in the areas of tech and life sciences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, public speaker is named Catherine. You may now speak at this time. Thank you. 
Hi, Catherine Dumont. I'm a resident of um, uh, uh, Linfield Oaks, and I just want to uh, speak in uh, support of uh, the news about um, studying um, more more housing and um, uh, it, it's appreciate the location um, uh, so close to downtown. The um, I understand that SRA you know doesn't even uh, need to include the housing. So the fact that they're willing to uh, to study more uh, variety of and um, and dedicated affordable and deeply affordable and special needs housing is super important and much appreciated by the community. I live within walking distance also of the area and I bike through um, this area. And I think that it gives us a really good um, opportunity as a city to make the safer for pedestrians and cyclists and to prioritize um, um, travel outside of car and using uh, transit options and um, revitalizing the downtown area uh, through more business and more commercial um, and more residential. So I hope that the commission will uh, give the guidance to the, uh, to the developers and SRI so they can move forward um with this uh, studies they need to do thank you very much thank you very much our uh, next public speaker it appears to be our last virtual public speaker is named sarah brophy you may now speak at this time thank you um hi my name is sarah brophy um i'm a resident of menlo park for the last 12 years um and i live and have lived all that time in the downtown area um and I would just like to register my support for this project. I think that increased housing is a major need in this community for people on low incomes, but people of all incomes. It's a major uh, mismatch between the availability of housing and the number of people who want to live here. So I just want to register my support for this project with as many units as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may, through the chair, we have a few comment cards for this item in person as well. I can start uh, calling them up. That would be terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our first public commenter in person uh, is named Phil. Uh, Phil, if you could come up, uh, you're welcome to speak on this item uh, at the podium. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to this very important uh, thing in Menlo Park. So um, I'm very concerned about the site master plan. I was asked last Tuesday afternoon, what is my vision for the SRI, SRI pro property? So I thought, thought about it and I could immediately say that, and this is sort of what I said, I imagine a tech, technologically advanced new structure designed to contemporary standards to house SRI, a company that creates world-changing solutions, making people safer, healthier, and more productive. They deserve a great space of iconic design and that says SRI on that campus. Um, I imagine housing 350, 450, 550, and then I said, but why not 800 or 1,000 or 1,200? I could easily get that many houses on that site. You just have to design it and design a beautiful structure or structures that reflect that. And then I imagine the community activities. And when I say that, I'm so appreciative of all the community activities that are shown on there. But why stop at that? I know that there are other needs. and even a group of pickleball courts and things that have been promised that would be a great opportunity to do it and address the noise. So we have a once in a lifetime opportunity here uh, for our community and neighborhood to provide input. Tonight, you have a master site plan before you. This is what I see you'll get. And when I look at the site plan, I'm not looking at paper. 
on just looking at what it, what it is. So SRI gets their old building initially, McCandless Office Park gets their views blocked, four-story parking structures and over one million new square feet of office space. You get 650 apartments and you get traffic gridlock. So there are a lot of negatives. So we'll leave it at that. And uh, I live within a few hundred yards of the SRI. Uh, property and we're here to stay. We've been here 30 years. Thank you very much for listening to me and hopefully we can have all these uh, concerns addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one additional uh, public speaker comment card. Uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, you may come up and speak at this time and if anyone else would like to speak, please walk over to me with the comment card uh, for this item. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, uh, my name is Michael Arusa. Um, I'm a resident of Menlo Park living um, near downtown, and I'd like to register my strong support uh, for this project and for an SRI that maximizes the amount of housing uh, built. I think the location is honestly a once in a lifetime opportunity for the city to build affordable housing near transit, um, near downtown, and I'm excited that SRI and Lane are taking full advantage of that. I appreciate that they've been receptive to feedback. Um, by increasing the number of units that they're willing to study, dedicating land to uh, purely affordable housing and being willing to look into increasing the land dedication. I think that is especially amazing. Um, and I also appreciate that they're willing to study up to 800 um, homes on the site. Uh, we just definitely need more housing and more affordable housing, especially on Menlo Park. And I love that they're willing to um, do that. I'm super excited for this project primarily for the affordable housing and housing units, but also the green open space, the shuttles, the bike lane. The space looks honestly awesome, and I can't wait to be able to bike through it, and I hope that it can support as many um, people living on it as possible. I ask that the commission advance the study so we can move forward with this project, and I thank both the commission and Lane and SRI. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Acting Chair Harris, at this time I, I see no other hands raised, and no other comment cards have been provided. Uh, so if you'd like, we could wait a little longer or we could close the public comment period. Let's wait about another 20 seconds. Sure thing. Okay, still no hands? That is correct. I see no ends, no additional ends. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who uh, is online and in person and um, provided us with this public comment. We really appreciate your feedback. Um, we certainly listen to it, and uh, we thank you so much for for helping us out here. I'd like to bring it back to the dais, both virtually and in person, for uh, the commissioners to. Um, discuss. We, we did begin discussions on the 23rd, but we had very little time, so most of us were speaking very quickly and only kind of highlighting our most important thoughts. So I'd like to give us a little bit more time um, to make sure that every commissioner feels like they have gotten their thoughts out. Um, also, I would request um, if Ms. Sandmeyer would be willing to put back up on the screen the um, the uh, items that you were interested in getting feedback on. There were about six or seven, so that we can be mindful of making sure that we hit um, all of those on, on the list. So who would like to start us out from the commission? Commissioner Doe. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, so the applicant's update has definitely responded to community comments and therefore anticipated um, the majority of my um, major comments. Um, so I won't say too much or ask too much, just to um, add my voice to the appreciation of integrating the acre, entertaining the possibility of increasing the size of that um, donated land and therefore the number of um, how affordable units and um, also supportive of the willingness to study up to 800 housing units um, as a, the, the higher end of housing scenario. Um, so that 
navigate through my notes here. Um, and, and again, also just, it's been said many times before, so I'm just gonna add my voice to that, appreciating the open space and connectivity through the site and the preservation of the heritage trees and particularly the native oaks. Um, bless you. Um, so I really, I think housing was my, the biggest concern I heard from the community. And like I said, I'm not gonna add anything to it because I'm supportive of the direction that it's headed. And so my, my other comments are on, um, on a much different level and it's just on the architectural design and style. And um, we're, we're hearing the, I, I don't know that, it seems like the existing buildings um, being built so long ago, they probably don't serve the need of uh, evolving, modern, innovative um, campus. But I just wanna reiterate um, something I mentioned to you before. Um, the possibility of somehow preserving and integrating building A. Um, I don't know how other people feel about it, but I, I do feel like there's something to architectural history and the layers that adds to our community. Um, and I, I, I personally find that the understated rhythm of solid and void and brick and glazing and building and courtyard is quite nice. Again, I, it probably doesn't serve the needs of a modern campus, but I'll just throw that out there. Um, and I also wanted to ask the applicant team and the architect um, on, on why they chose the mission style architecture. I believe that's the term that was used in the staff report. Do we have, oh, we do. <laughs> um, while he's coming up, could um, we put back up the um, schematic of the current design um, on the screen? please. Go ahead, Mr. Okay. Lee. <laughs> Thank Hi. you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. To address your question, uh, uh, Ms. Doe, the, the architectural style uh, is a, a der derivative of, of mission style. Uh, it came by way of some of the indigenous uh, uh, architectural styles in Menlo Park currently. Uh, also, it draws a little bit from some of the uh, architectural uh, language of the neighborhoods, uh, Linfield Oaks, uh, Burgess Park, and some of those uh, uh, references that we took uh, uh, from those neighborhoods and brought them into the into the residential uh, part of the project. Um, we think the the, uh, the qualities of the mission style do give it uh, a characteristic that links uh, the the housing element of of the master plan to the rest of the neighborhood. Again, you mentioned earlier about appreciating some of the open space connectivity through the site. Uh, architecturally, we, we also felt that it was important to have the residential side of our project relate to the residential uh, character of, of, the, of the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, thank, thank you. Um, and, and first, I just wanna say, I'm a really enthusiastic fan of early 20th century gems of mission revival architecture. Um, and again, really enjoy the sense of history that they bring to our community. And um, I realize this is a rather vague question, but I just wonder if there are um, other opportunities here to express the what's poetic about the site that defies being categorized as any historic or revival style. Um, I haven't walked through the site, but I've certainly walked by the site many times. And I just wonder if you, if you get away from style, if you can allow the architecture to incorporate those elements that you mentioned of human scale, of welcoming, of gathering and protection without necessarily having to be um, a style. And I only say this because when I go through that site, I feel such a strong physical presence of the trees, the greenery, the deep shade. Um, and again, I realize it's vague and subjective, but for what it's worth, I just wonder if um, the site gives, can give itself to other expressions that don't necessarily conform to a historic or revival style. And again, I, I apologize. I feel like these comments are very, <laughs> from a different level of, you know, there's so much good going on with this project with the um, increased housing and the connectivity. So I just want to put it in perspective that I overall really, really appreciate um, the updates and, and this project. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Doe. Who would like to speak next? Uh, 
uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yeah, thank you. Um, this may bounce around a little bit, but there are maybe five points I'd like to address. And I'd like to start with asking uh, through the chair, if I could ask staff. Please. Um, regarding TDM, it's common for us to make a requirement for commercial. Do we uh, have any TDM programs to refer to that address residential? Um, so this is this will be a new general plan designation, a new zoning designation. So a TDM requirement could be put in place um, for both residential and commercial. Um, certainly for specific plan projects, the TDM requirements apply to um, both types of uses. Well, I appreciate that. I've been uh, I was actually wondering whether we have, any reference point within the city um, have we or any of our adjacent agencies um, enacted a tdm requirement on a housing project so we have some kind of sense as to uh, what to aim for Well, so the Bayfront Zoning District, I believe there's a 20% reduction requirement. Um, and we can certainly look at examples from other jurisdictions as well. Well, the 20% the is helpful tonight. Thank you. Um, so just, just to complete that, um, I think one of the more important uh, requests that I could make as a commissioner that uh, there be a very aggressive TDM program for this project. It's downtown and it is poised to succeed. And if up on Bayfront Expressway, we can ask for 50% TDM I think that we can ask for at least that here uh, in, in this community. And this would make uh, a huge difference, I think in particular, and most immediately to the adjacent residences that are already there, but also to anyone uh, involved in a cross town commute. My neighbor doesn't bother to say anything because he feels it would fall on deaf ears after 20 years, but his crosstown effort in the morning simply to cross Menlo Park at between 8 and 8.30 in the morning takes him 10 minutes longer than if he simply drove to San Francisco. So we have a lot of work to do there. Um, <clears throat> my second point has to do with the number of uh, homes that we're aiming for. Um, I will share that I did discuss late last week some elements of this project with the applicant. And I understand that and accept that this project is not going to be uh, as uh, housing centric as some of our Bayfront projects, which uh, are up to 100%. Um, however, we hear repeated calls, not just personal calls of people who would like to see more housing downtown, but the very solid rationale that, again, transportation and adjacencies make this the ideal place to have greater density. I'm not the biggest fan of density, but we are going to have increased density in Menlo Park. We have RENA numbers to meet, and I don't foresee any site in the next eight years uh, as promising as this site. And so um, I would like to, uh, first of all, express my appreciation for uh, Park Lane's willingness to look at 800 units 
I do think in terms of the EIR that it would still be helpful to council to see an alternative that is closer to 1,700 units, not with the expectation that 1,700 units would be likely or logical for this site, but I think it would help council to understand what it is, the, the choice that is being made here, because we will probably always be asked, why did we not build more housing at this site? Um, personally, I'm particularly uh, enthusiastic about the level of affordability. I think 30% affordable is a great step forward. I have often um, tried to react quietly to the irony of the many speakers who come to this commission for this project and for others and say how much they support a project because it's going to provide housing. And for virtually all the projects that we've seen here, they have been roughly 15% affordable and the rest market rate. And much of the affordable is affordable as in $4,000 a month for a three bedroom apartment. <clears throat> um, so the hopes that people have and the support that they offer are for affordable housing. And yet time and again, we build market rate housing in the vast majority. That is what we approve. I think any effort to move beyond the 30% would, at least in my opinion, be more important than increasing the total number of, um, of units built. Um, it's also uh, something I keep in mind. Um, Pam Jones is uh, one of those who has reminded me in the past that we're not building ownership housing. And there are economic reasons for that. Um, a significant one is a, a California law that, uh, that puts the builder of condominiums in a liability position for the first 10 years of uh, the existence of the condos. And therefore, we see apartments built instead. Um, However, apartments in the old world are not uncommon at all. Um, it's just that leases are different. Um, I did um, have the good fortune of living for several months in a flat in Rome in a building that was uh, at least six centuries old. And the owner had a 99 year lease. Therefore, they considered that property to be their home long-term home, they invested in it. If they had to remodel, they would put in today's dollars, $100,000 to remodel it. They would be able to transfer their lease for a fee, which was similar to, frankly, to uh, private property ownership. Um, pardon that long intro, but I think we could benefit from rental units that had longer leases. Um, I think the one-year lease uh, is sort of a travesty in terms of um, economic stability for people of all incomes. And I would like to just throw out the option <clears throat> that these apartments be offered with something more like a 10-year lease. Um, and I certainly wouldn't make that a requirement, but I would like to um, hear the applicant's um, thoughts about that possibility. And I'd like to also hear uh, perhaps from Pam Jones and others about what that option might do for, particularly for affordable renters. And then finally, I would just like to um, keep on the table and um, Last week, uh, I 
I did hear from the applicant regarding progress on the notion of realigning Ravenswood <clears throat> with the Ringwood intersection for uh, traffic flow and safety. Um, and I do look forward to seeing some progress on that on the next application. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Um, to the applicant, would you like to comment on Commissioner Riggs' idea of a 10-year lease option or something that is longer than a one-year lease? Uh, sure, we're, we're open to <clears throat> offering that. I mean, not, I'm not sure that's something the market demand would, would be there for, but we're happy to, happy to explore it. Um, I, I think some of the structures you're talking about in foreign countries you know they where they have financing for things like that are um probably aren't available here for like the 99 year version but potentially there's something you know a, as you said that i was thinking about more of some of the affordable units potentially there's somewhere to partner with i've seen habitat for humanity at different hearings and they have some pretty creative financing structures that i'm not that familiar with but protect potentially partnering with a group like that where they sort of you know buy the by the apartment unit and then they can kind of structure something from there and we would obviously you know work with them on the financing of that but maybe there's something creative to kind of end up with something similar to what what you're speaking to commissioner riggs but i i think it'd be most apt for affordable units because those are ones where you're actually trying to get the the, the value down right we're selling a ground lease might be cheaper than buying a condo somewhere it, it certainly should be uh so maybe that's a that's a benefit in that scenario it's certainly something we can look into but um, not something we're, you know, expertise in saying, hey, we, we can do that. We've done that. It's a little different. No, that's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Um, who would, who else would like to, oh, Commissioner Schindler, please. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I, I would like to start just by briefly thanking all the members of the community who have showed up at multiple hearings over the course of the last 12 months to voice support um, and to those who've given constructive feedback on how they would like to see this proposal change. Um, this is exactly the way that it works. Thank you so much for investing your time and energy and making your community a better place. Um, and I'd like to really thank the applicant. I'd like to thank Lane and SRI just for their being here and listening. Um, I think tonight and your, your presentation was yet another example of how you have absorbed, listened to, and responded to <clears throat> excuse me, feedback from the community, feedback from the commissioners here. Um, so thank you. Um, you've actually, I've just redlined out a bunch of my comments because I'm thrilled to see some of the things that are, show, are, are going to be considered for the next round of application. Um, I said this before last time and I'll just briefly reiterate how important an opportunity. I also think this is for the community. Many people have said this here tonight. I also think this is a once in multi-generation opportunity for all of the reasons that have been laid out here. Um, again, for all of those reasons, this site is, is also at the top of my list um, of all of the identified opportunities that this community has for the next eight plus years. Um, it is definitely the best opportunity to grow in a way that is thoughtful and strategic. Um, it's also a, already a really strong proposal, and so all of my commentary and questions and, and sort of iterations here tonight are in the spirit of just refining things to really as close to perfection as we can get because this is so important um, for, our, for our community. And it's such a, we want to, I want to set a bar so high um, for what we can accomplish here. Um, so I wanted to start with something that I touched on very quickly uh, in the last meeting, um, starting with just my thoughts about what was happening at the Northeast corner, that intersection of Ravenswood and Middlefield. Um, so I think what I said last time was just that there was a lot trying to be accomplished in that space between the soccer field, the possibility of the reservoir, the buildings that go with the reservoir, et cetera. Um, so I was thrilled to hear that under consideration is taking the, the um, donated parcel of land for affordable housing potentially out of that corner. Um, I think that has the added benefit of moving it closer to residential. It also possibly makes that, that corner more effective uh, in accomplishing some of the things that it was originally laid out to be. Um, let's see, uh, I did want to say that I hope the park, that parking garage one, which is closest to that corner, can eventually be used in some ways by the church and the soccer field during non-business hours um, to help reduce potentially the surface parking that happens there. 
Um, last time we talked about this particular corner, uh, Commissioner Hurigs brought up the possibility of realigning that traffic intersection. Um, I was going to ask for more details about that here tonight. I'm not sure if, if staff or the applicant are prepared to, to, to share a little bit more about how that process um, sort of gets, how that a potential street realignment um, plays into the development process um, so that we can set our expectations about what happens in the next couple of months. So uh, through the chair, I'm actually not sure if this is a question to staff or to the applicant or both. Um, how do we learn more about the realignment of that intersection? those two intersections. Ms. Sandmeyer, is that something that has been uh, considered in the past, um, would be considered uh, if, if that were something that uh, was desired by, I guess, Planning Commission and City Council? Yeah, so that's, um, it's come up in previous study sessions and planning um, will coordinate further with uh, transportation division on that, that possibility. Go ahead. A realignment issue. Um, you know, we, we are open to facilitating a study to that. I think, I think one of the concerns we have is this is a, a pretty significant decision I'm a little concerned about it being kind of a footnote to our redevelopment. I totally understand why this is the appropriate time to, to kind of look at it, but I think we would ask that. I think what, what the city would need from Parkline is really a potential easement for that road and maybe contribution to, to studying that. But I think it creates a lot of complications for our EIR to have kind of two different, uh, you know, traffic is a major thing we study. I think it's a, it's a complicated thing to kind of look at two different realities simultaneously. So I think what we would ask is that we, you know, we provide, if the city does want to pursue that route, we provide kind of what the city needs in terms of, you know, potential future easement and things like that and coordination. But I, I don't think we, I think that should be kind of a, it's a big enough deal to be kind of a separate community process, separate and apart from park line, but we're providing what, what the community needs with our community benefits, if that, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'm not a, a sort of traffic architect, but I certainly would anticipate that the realignment of Ravenswood Ringswood in that middle field would be a really big project. Um, but it was one of the things that came to, to mind for me when I was thinking about the inter that particular intersection. Um, I'm particularly think when I looked at the loop road, um, I was thinking about the bike traffic and potentially auto traffic that would look for a shortcut. Um, to avoid that, that sometimes busy intersection, particularly at, at morning and afternoon times of day. Um, and so in thinking about how to mitigate um, that shortcut that could be taken, which would, could create safety issues um, and, and traffic complexity, but I think tra traffic was, excuse me, safety was the bigger one. Um, that alignment, realignment of the intersection caught my attention when it came up earlier in conversation. Actually, what was what we were doing with bike and ped from the beginning was kind of running uh, bike and ped down, you know, around the church through Ringwood to kind of the idea was separate bike and ped traffic from pedestrian as much as you can. And I think we're really thinking about MA kids in particular, like get them to ride their bikes through, you know, away from the intersection of Ravenswood and Middlefield, which I, it really gets congested, particularly a drop off in the morning. There's kind of kids everywhere crossing from different angles to so try to divert that we we were doing that real we are doing proposing that realignment idea but just for bike and ped and trying to leave you know vehicle traffic where it is but again we're open to to, to helping with this we're just concerned about it being you know co conflated with with park line um all right so i think i have a couple of, of additional thoughts on top of the the traffic intersection um let's see I think the, in terms of feedback on land use, my primary feedback was also on residential density and just the, the um, discussion today of studying higher density up to 800 units really is, is I think a dialing up of the right motivate of the right goals um, for this project. Um, like Commissioner Riggs, I think that having a higher affordable percentage 
um, is the primary goal. Um, and if there's a trade-off to be made, that's, 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 as, that, that's, that's the top pri priority. Um, I also wanted to, let's see, I think just in terms of a bit of feedback, um, I think the directive or the goal of keeping residential and commercial traffic separate makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I think that the plan as, it la as it's laid out <clears throat> um, is very logical. I would like to understand how we think the Middle Avenue Caltrans tunnel um, might potentially affect pedestrian and biking traffic and, and flow through the area. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Commissioner Riggs, um, I really look forward to seeing a very thoughtful and proactive um, TDM because I think that is when we get to the appropriate stage um, that has been repeatedly identified as, as an essential way to address the concerns about traffic um, that have understandably been mentioned by many of the voices in the community. Um, and then in terms of architectural feedback, um, I think the, 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 uh, the visuals provide a, a good and simple start to a mission style oriented um, structure in, on the residential side of things. Um, I do hope to see some just increased variations in details as the design uh, proceeds. Um, I don't have any feedback on the, the non-residential architecture at this time. Uh, and then finally, just in terms of land use specific to the amenities, um, I think in the last study session, it was mentioned that the office amenity center may be open to the public um, and to tenants of other office buildings along Middlefield, which I think is fantastic to improve the vibrancy of the area. Um, and I do look forward to seeing what kind of programming is proposed to go with some of the, the great community amenities um, that will help residents stay in the open spaces and all of the great um, community elements, the fields, the food, um, the, the, the event pavilion. I know that we are doing a lot of to bring, the, the plan does a lot to bring the community into the open space and into the um, community amenities. I want them, I hope that they will stick and I look forward to seeing the, the programming um, and potentially the expansion of the size of some of those amenities that will help the community just spend that much more time there. Out of that. Okay, thank you. The, you don't have to, you can, we can always come back. <laughs> um, I guess I'd like, I wasn't planning to address the idea behind the realignment, um, but I guess since it's been brought up, I, I think that the way that the applicant has designed this to date addresses the bigger issue for me, which is safety, given that bike and ped can now um, avoid that um, situation, that, that intersection. Um, I guess I'm, I would like, I'd be interested to have it studied to find out what effect it might have. Um, but I would imagine it would be very expensive and perhaps I'd rather see that um, spent on uh, bike, ped, and transit. So uh, I'm definitely open to looking at it, but I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sold on making that change. Um, I'm wondering, um, why don't I go to Commissioner Barnes, who has his hand up, and then I have a few more points, but I can uh, hold off on them till later. Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to, to make some comments. The first thing I want to note is that I did have a, I guess the fancy term for it is ex parte discussion with the applicant. We are asked to disclose those. I, as a matter of course, don't have discussions with applicants prior to meetings because I like to have all my questions asked in the open for the first time so I can hear the responses and the public can hear it. What I did though is I, I did make the call to understand what was said during the time that the mic uh, that I couldn't hear being from remote um, where I have some audio difficulties. So I'm uh, stating that for the record that I did have that ex parte discussion with the applicant. Um, one of the things, we, so I have nothing additional to disclose um, from that discussion that isn't, hasn't been heard tonight. What we did talk about a little bit was uh, the standalone project and um, bounced around ideas for where else on the site it could be. Um, 
And I know there's some reticence in the community around uh, standalone projects that are 100% affordable. And there's a perception that it is uh, a manner of segregation by economics. Um, it's just the fact of how these 100% affordable and deep, low affordabilities, the extremely low income, very low income projects get financed that require 100% um, affordable projects. So it is a necessary evil and I, and I do welcome the repositioning of it on the site so that it feels more integrated uh, within the site, even if it is uh, its own building. Um, a couple notes I have. Uh, one of them is related to some of the discussions we're having around car trips. And uh, I will note that one way to really get after uh, car trips is uh, certainly locating uh, employment by transit. Uh, and sometimes, you know, as opposed to housing in, in that, um, with employment and with one employment center, you have at least a fixed to from destination. Uh, for instance, in this case, in the SRI location, if you know that's used uh, as it's contemplated for the for the research and, and employment center, um, you at least have folks that have that as a fixed location. Whereas for housing, you just don't know where folks are going to, whether they're going to have an employment situation which is uh, located by other transit stops whether they can get to it. But when you have uh, commercial or employment by transit, it often works very, very well for uh, managing car trips, which is one of the reasons why you wanna have meaningful commercial by, by transit. Um, so that's an endorsement for the commercial component uh, related to you know, reduction of car trips. Um, the clarification, uh, one of the clarifications I have through the chair uh, to the applicant uh, is the note about this project having 30% affordability. And I'd like to get a clarification on that. Are you, you being the, the applicant, referencing a blended rate between the 100% affordable project and the BMR units, if you could, uh, for the record, kind of state what that 30% affordability number represents. Yeah, th that's correct, Commissioner Barnes. It's a blend between the two components. So in our last submittal, which is 550 units, you have a 15% affordable inclusionary component within the 450, and then the land dedication would yield another 80 to 100 units, 100% of which would be affordable. And those would be, you know, we'd be targeting, you know, low, very low ELI income levels, try to generate IDD units, but really hit, you know, the where there's the most demand um, and, and the least supply for, for certain vulnerable populations. So our goal and what we'll be trying to do in our, our next submittal is both, you know, increase the number of units, you know, certainly in the study, but also try to find a way to not only have more units, but, but continue to increase that percentage of affordability. And I think, you know, Commissioner Riggs mentioned earlier, you know, that that's more important than than the unit count. And also like, that's just the reality of, of what we have to deal with. We think that 800 unit is really the, as a study is our, our, the maximum we can feasibly do without really undoing the integrity of, 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 the, of the campus SRI needs. So we're committed to studying that, but we're, we're gonna really try to focus, as we did in our last submittal, really focus on trying to deliver the greatest number of, of, of affordable units. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I could sense there was some, I think a lack of clarity around that. Um, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so I'll use that as, a, as a, a moment to kind of further the uh, point made by Commissioner Riggs and go a little bit farther down that path. Um, you know, if the community is looking for uh, deeply affordable units and affordable units, uh, the way through this is through these 
100% affordable projects, which offer the deep affordabilities. I mean, we have seen, we saw in the last housing element, what um, you know, the BMR, getting 15% BMR and generating more and more housing to try to get numbers. So if, if the goal, for instance, one of the goals of the community, a stated goal is hitting the arena numbers, we've seen that it's just not, um, it's not something that works to build your way through uh, into the deeper affordability numbers just by adding market rate and trying to find 15, you know, trying to find affordable, um, low, deep affordable units through the BMR components. Uh, you, you end up getting vastly over-indexed on uh, market rate and, and under-indexed on the deeply affordable. Now, if the desire of the community is just more housing writ large, uh, inclusive of a very significant component, you know, currently 85% being at market rate. If that's it, if that's the desire, which is to add uh, more units for the sake of units, then that in and of itself, I think is a, can be a, a stated goal, but it's a, I think conflating the issue between um, trying to build your way through it with getting the, uh, meaningful amounts at scale of deeply affordable units are two different things. You have to go uh, deeply affordable, 100% affordable projects, or you uh, or you just don't get there. And we saw that, and we've seen that in the last housing element, and we saw what happened. We've seen the production numbers over the last you know five six years in this community. Um, so I, I continue to encourage you know those standalone projects here and, and in other places as the way through. Um, through this issue of deep affordabilities. Uh, I, I have a question again, sorry for having the applicant uh, sit down, but I was hoping through the chair to ask another question about BMR units. And this is more of a educational uh, exercise. If that's okay through the chair to ask the applicant an additional question. Please. So uh, thank you for standing up again, Mr. Murray. Um, through the I'm trying to understand the economics, if you will, of, of BMR units. Um, so I'll just give an example for purposes of discussion. If a unit uh, at market rate is a dollar a year for a two bedroom um, apartment, and there are units which are, for instance, in the inclusionary or inclusionary units, and they're 50 cents for instance, uh, a year for, for that unit, for whatever component it is, because they're different AMIs and you know, different types. Purpose of discussion, 50 cents a year on what would be a dollar a year market rate unit. How does that 50 cents per year get made up? You've got, for instance, a hole in your financing stack and you've got to perform a rent. So there, there's that you have to work through. And then you've got you know the 50 cents less per year in operating income to work the project. Um, does that 50 cents per year that you're not getting on a BMR unit come from developer uh, yield, developer margins? Does it come from distributing that uh, 50, foregone 50 cents per year across other units? Just how does this work when you have um, affordability levels and, and the BMR components spread. Uh, yeah, it's a part. very good question. And your question, you know, kind of implies the answer that it has to be holistically the pro forma for the, when you have a, you know, 85% market rate and 15% affordable uh, as a whole, the development has to underwrite itself. So yeah, it really is. It's kind of all of those things you said, but I, I think the best way to phrase it is, yeah, that, that your, your total rent is spread out among your total units and, that's the numerator and denominator and, and does that create a, a viable development? I would also say like there are massive, massive swings in terms of that, you know, dollar versus 50 cents. I think moderate income, you know, allows residents with up to, you know, 120% of, of AMI, I believe is, is that standard, which is, you know, for this area, you know, that, that's a AMI is pretty significant. So I think that versus a market rate is a much closer thing. Whereas you're trying to, you know, that's why it makes it so challenging to come up with, you know, very low ELI units is because that delta between market rate and, and the rents you charge in those units is, is so vast. 
which is all the more reason why, you know, partnering with a nonprofit group who, you know, they, they know how to, you know, design, but also to tap into, you know, governmental and, you know, county and state funding and things like that to create um, developments, which are all low, very low ELI um, projects. Like they, they have a specialty to do that, which obviously, you know, normal private market economics wouldn't get, wouldn't get close to, but that's, I, I think, yeah, that, that's kind of how it works. I appreciate that, and that was certainly not a question intended to uh, lead a witness in any direction. But what it and what it causes me to to further think about is, um, you know, the, the fairness of 100% affordable projects to get to meaningful affordabilities, as opposed to um, getting it through more housing and then BMR which in effect penalizes the uh, renter in 5A, in 5B, in 5C, all the way down the, the road to accommodate for the other one, when in fact they may have their own rent burdens and they may have their own economic challenges. Um, and just assuming that because they're renting at market rate, to assume that they have uh, excess, excess economic capacity to pay um, I think is is not a, a fair thing to um, to assume, and I think uh, I think we need to get through affordability through these through um, Litech through 100% uh, affordable tax credit finance projects, and not through um, just straight up more housing than a 15% BMR component. Um, thank you, Mr. Murray, for your sure. comments. Um, Couple other thoughts I have here is um, what I'd really like to see uh, on this site uh, is, you know, in the context of it being 63 acres, in the context of 25 of the, these acres being for or consisting of publicly accessible open space, uh, I think this project demands for the community to regulation sports fields. These regulation sports fields are approximately 360 feet by 240 feet. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to ask for two that get programmed for the community. Uh, I also would like to see the uh, addition or the, uh, the opportunity for the city of Menlo Park School District to uh, have office space on this campus as well, 10 to 15,000 square feet, uh, and get out of the Encinal uh, location where the um, elementary school is co-located with the uh, school district offices. And uh, both of those are needs as I understand it. And I wanted to, through the chair, ask the applicant um, if, uh, what the applicant's thinking was on dedicating two regulation sports fields and some space for the Benno Park School District, uh, you know, within the 1.38 million square feet, uh, 10,000 square feet, although you would have to carve it out to be separate and distinct from, you know, the facilities that you're contemplating for research and development. So again, to uh, through the chair to the applicant, uh, if Mr. Murray would address those two. Sure. Uh, Karina, are you able to pull up the, uh, I think it's the fourth slide in our presentation, just the one with our, you know, the current master plan. Yeah, let's see. Vaughn, could you pull that up? Thank you. And we can start discussing in the meantime, but um, uh, the, the sports field is something we, we've heard from other folks in the community. We do have a, a sports field at the corner of Ravenswood and Middlefield now. Uh, I'm not sure if it meets the parameters of a of 360 by 240, but but I'll confirm that and let you know. So it's just the next slide. That's all right, one, one more. So we, we do have that one area, and, and there, it, it's there for a reason. I mean, again, as we mentioned before, we have heritage trees kind of peppered all over the site. This, as you drive by, is actually a you know, existing surface parking lot. So it's actually a great location where you don't have a lot of 
uh, trees that are in the way. Um, so that's where we found for that sports field. Another good location would be that that surface parking area directly to the church. I don't know if we touched on this last time, but you know the church just owns their one acre site, but they do have some rights that implicate the SRI site. Uh, you'll see there's a road that's kind of on the west side um, of the church site. That's a ingress and egress easement over SRI property, uh, which the church holds. They also have a, you'll see kind of a connector road in the back. Uh, that's a, also an obligation. Also, we need to provide access to Ringwood, which is, we're, we're taking care of all these things in the, in the current submittal. But then, then they also have a right to 125 stalls. Those are currently right at the corner of Middlefield and Ravenswood, so we'll be shifting them to the other side of the church. We have the right to move those around, but they have to stay adjacent to um, the church property. We have discussed this with the church. We're going to continue to discuss this with the church about we have abundant parking. You know, I mean, like most churches, their, their parking needs are our evening and weekends. We have abundant parking. We can give them more than 125 stalls. Uh, we have mentioned that to them and, and, and talked about ways to achieve that, but you know that hasn't come to fruition yet. But we we haven't given up on that. But I uh, that would be I think our best location where you know. But for those private parking rights, that surface parking doesn't need to be there. Uh, so that that's something we're working on. But I think that would be a great opportunity to to increase open space, particularly larger format stuff like like sports fields or pickleball or or anything like that. I know pickleball has come up a few times. That's a something the community really desires. It's also tough to cite because no one wants it near their house. I think we have some places in that, in particularly in that corner, that would be pretty ideal from a, from a citing standpoint uh, where we could fit something like that. And that, that's what we'd hope to do. We're hoping to generate some more, more open space that, that area as well. It would, uh, sorry, did Chair, may I um, continue? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it would stand a reason or conversely seem crazy that uh, the Sunday parking needs, for instance, for the church couldn't be accommodated in a very expensive parking garage being built, um, you know, what is it, 100 yards away. Uh, so it would be great to see um, co-location of parking for the church uh, in that parking structure that's being contemplated right there. Um, and then to the question of a second field, uh, is that something that you are open to contemplating should the, uh, should the site, is that something you're open, open to contemplating? Yes, I, I think, uh, again, that location I mentioned is kind of your your best bet, but we can certainly try to you know, we're, we're here to get comments on on all kinds of things uh, and how to improve the site. So I, I, absolutely, I think it'll be challenging given the trees and, and, and the master plan layout, but uh, let us try. Great. So, you know, my ask is, is there's two soccer fields. And I say that, you know, soccer fields that can be programmed for Alpine Strikers, for the local youth soccer, for local youth lacrosse, for adult leagues. You know, a lot of turns on a turf field that can be programmed over and over again uh, because there simply isn't it. And this is a 63 acre site that is in close proximity to virtually every neighborhood. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense to do that. And then lastly, on the question of uh, the potentiality of um, office space for the school district, is that something, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually something I discussed with, um, you know, both the prior superintendent and uh, Kristen Garcia as well. So it's it's something we're keeping keeping in mind. My understanding, I don't want to speak for the school district, is it's, it's not a today need. It's probably a, you know, five year out thing. But I think it, it, it's great to keep that in mind and fine. Again, I hope hopefully your ranges of square footage. I'll try to confirm that with the district of what is that square footage need and try to keep a place within. Um, within the site where they can, you know, future proof the school by ha having a site, they know they can move those offices to. That's great. And I think, you know, by the time this project comes out of the ground and gets bodies in there, we're five years down the road. Right. Um, anyhow, so timing wise, it's, uh, it works well, I think. Um, so, so thank you for that. And in closing, 
I'll say that you know this is this will be my general remark. You know, this is an SRI campus, and um, I appreciate the balance between uh, the different components of the master plan um, and SRI, what it wants to do with it, its campus. So thank you for bringing things forward today. Uh, thank you uh, to SRI for contemplating these changes because you know it is in fact SRI who's who's a master plan this is and who site this is and Lane Partners being you know the the folks that have been um, selected to to execute on what SRI wants to do. So thank you for bringing all that forward, and those are my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Um, do we have other commissioners that with, wish to speak? Otherwise, okay, yes. Yeah, I. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, Commissioner Riggs, can I go with Commissioner Tate? She hasn't had a chance. Oh, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Someone there has something. No, no, we'd, we'd like to hear from you, Commissioner Tate, if it's okay. Okay. And I'll be quick and I'll be cutting my camera back off. I'm having some internet situation over here and freezing like crazy. Um, I too spoke with the applicant um, um, prior to this meeting, so just wanted to disclose that. Um, I do appreciate uh, all that SRI is trying to do and wanting to incorporate housing um, on this lot. However, I still feel the same way um, that I felt earlier on, and that has been expressed by several of the community um, um, residents. And that is, and, and also Commissioner Riggs um, in that, it would be great to study more than the 800 units uh, for this site. And I like uh, Ms. Jones, definitely, and I voiced it um, in our last meeting, uh, wanted the, the affordable housing to be over closer to the market rate housing. However, I'm thinking now, um, would we get more units, affordable units, if it weren't integrated uh, in that area? Would maybe donating more, more units or more land, which the, the um, applicant has said that they are going to do, donate more to affordable, which is fantastic. But could we get more units out of that if it wasn't sitting right next to the other units? And um, I'd be interested to, to know whether or not that would be a possibility or make sense. Um, and, and especially because even though it's right next to the other units, the market rate units, everyone's going to know that it's the affordable building anyway, which was what we didn't want, you know, them to be uh, ostracized, so to speak. The kids, um, I believe, was how uh, Riggs brought it up in our previous meeting, that all the kids would know that the kids that lived in those units are the the below market rate units. So that's something that I'm definitely interested in taking a look at if possible. Um, I know that the applicant uh, keeps saying that 800 is their maximum, which I appreciate them, you know, because it is a, a, a working site and they're putting housing in. But if we could study more units, that would be fantastic. Um, and just the conversation just a couple of minutes ago about um, adding another field and um, the proximity to the church. If I'm not mistaken, earlier on in this project, the church was concerned because there had been a thought of a, of, of a playing field right next to their lot. And um, they were concerned about the noise level. And, and am I correct on that? Um, this is a question to the applicant. Uh, yeah, that is correct. The, the church expressed concern with not the field all the time, but noise during during service hours, or I think or Thursday evenings and, and Sunday morning, we had expressed like, you know, the idea of being able to, you know, limit the field usage during those hours is a potential solution. I, I don't know if they were comfortable with that. We're going to continue that conversation. We just had one site plan this evening, but we actually have a lot of in, in the current application. I think we have one where the that field sort of rotates 90 degrees behind the church. So, and then we were, we, you know, before we were talking about potentially putting the affordable housing there. And one of the benefits to that was it would create sort of a sound buffer for the church property. There's actually two buildings. There's kind of the, the real church building where services are held at fronts on Ravenswood. And there's kind of a single story kind of flex building, which is for offices and meetings. So if we had structures kind of, you know, between 
the church building and the field, you'd have a lot of sound attenuation and maybe that would, would mitigate that. But yeah, that is a, a another thing to keep in mind with, with the sports field. Okay, very good. Now, since you're there, um, so what about um, if, if the affordable units were not in close proximity with the uh, market rate units, would you be able to, do you think, uh, expand the number of units? since you're not trying to like juggle within that space and with your height restrictions that you have because of your satellite and all those other components that are there. I, I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. I, I think what we're looking for tonight, and I, I think we're like is, can we proceed with, you know, studying up to 800 just in the SQL box? And so we understand like what the maximums are, then give us a chance to go back and put all these comments together and try to come back with a better plan. I can tell you our goal is both to relocate the affordable dedication where it's very much integrated into the rest of the housing and and enlarge it. We think that's possible, but th that's going to take some study. We can't show anything to you tonight or or make any guarantees. But, you know, we again, I think there was Commissioner Riggs comments earlier. We we have you know, we have restrictions in terms of like just the viability of the site and going above 800. But let us try to do something really above and beyond from an affordability standpoint. But that, that, that's going to take some time. That's going to take some study. We really want to get going with the SQL analysis. And in parallel with doing that SQL analysis, we'll have the chance to make resubmittals that, that kind of bakes all of these comments in, you know, to the best of our ability. But that will be the goal. Have an integrated, you know, contiguous housing element or housing district within our project, which will include a really significant affordable component, both inclusionary and, and via the dedication. Okay, sounds good. Um, but I'm I'm going to go back to Riggs's point about um, doing an analysis of more units uh, so that City Council can take a look at what that looks like, and um, and so that residents can take a look at what that looks like. Um, I understand about uh, uh, your limitations uh, because you're running a business and you're willing to put in the housing units, which is fantastic. Um, however, I think that that would satisfy curiosity with a lot of of residents who are proponents of more than 800 units. And also um, um, help us to understand better uh, really what can be done. And, um, and with us understanding, of course, and the public has understood from, from your position tonight that your maximum is 800 units. Um, and uh, I think that that's about all I have. I'm, I like the project, otherwise it's great. Um, the TDM uh, uh, concerns, I, I do appreciate those from my colleagues also. And, um, and otherwise, like I said, I think it's a great project and I'm happy to see housing that um, is over on, on that side of 101, close to El Camino and the affordable component, which will really be life-changing for a lot of families because their children will get a chance to have education and better school district than what exists on, on this side of the freeway. So I really do appreciate that. And thank you again for all your work on this. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. You had a few other comments. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'll admit part of it is uh, follow up or in reaction to what I've heard tonight. Um, so really just two things. Um, one, kind of the bigger thing is uh, regarding the site planning as we, um, you know, conceptually move around these blocks that have been um, so carefully placed and so much work has gone in already. Um, <clears throat> we know or we hope uh, a lot of this is still fluid and I, uh, in the absence of our uh, former chair, um, I, I would like to repeat the desire that it would be so nice if instead of three parking structures, there could ultimately be two. And it would be terrific if the TDM program demonstrated that that is viable. Um, or that at the very least, it be reduced to one or two levels on top of which is some affordable housing. I think that would be a much better use of the site. And I hope that that can come to be. 
And then um, regarding the idea of a second soccer field, um, I was already so appreciative to see a single soccer field um, added to this site, um, pretty much walking distance from Burgess, that um, uh, it certainly had not occurred to me to ask for a second soccer field. But we've, we've had a brief reference to pickleball. And um, it's an interesting to, position to be in because I'm a tennis player and am often concerned that uh, pickleball will try to overrun tennis courts. Uh, which are short uh, in short supply, not just in Menlo Park, but in all the adjacent towns. It happens that tennis uh, as a sport has grown in the last two years, notably grown. However, pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the United States. And I can tell you that at this point, must be half of my tennis friends are now playing pickleball as well, and many non-tennis friends and they need courts. And they need courts in places that are not adjacent to residences because pickleball, at least in its current technology, makes noise. Um, and so I would, um, and I apologize if um, I am dashing some hopes of my fellow uh, commissioner, but I would lobby to have one sports field and to have uh, maybe four pickleball courts, noting that um, on a sports field, which is most likely to be used for soccer and will keep 22 pairs of feet busy, um, 20 pairs of feet <clears throat> don't take anywhere near as much for doubles uh, pickleball court. They are, those courts are about the size of a second bedroom. So I hope that, um, slight exaggeration, so I, uh, I would just like to put in a pitch there as we nudge your um, uh, mix. And I neglected to say um, my support for the reservoir under the sports field. I don't really think you need our input. I'm sure staff has already indicated the value of that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. I have a few uh, points that I would like to make. I, I also met with the applicant to discuss <clears throat> some aspects of the project. Um, the first thing is I'd like to praise the applicant for increasing um, the both the total number as well as the potential for the 100% affordable number. Um, I would be supportive of a variant of 100 units so we can get your EIR going. I agree that we want to get this moving as soon as possible. But with that 800, I would like to assume that at least 200 are affordable. Um, I know that you said you were open to either increasing the acreage for the affordable and or increasing the density. I think that there is no reason why we couldn't have 200 there and then maybe, you know, plus your 15%. So I would be in support of that and I would support um, that being the variant that we study um, or your, your total that we study in the EIR. <clears throat> um, if there's a move to study 1700 as an alternative, we could also consider that. Um, but I want to be um, I do want to just appreciate that you have been willing to move up um, to the 800. Um, I, uh, as we're talking about um, housing, I'd like to bring other uh, one more point, which is the housing mix. Um, and this may be also a question for staff as well. Um, I'm a little concerned, well, I am concerned that we have a very small percentage of three bedrooms. We've got the 19 um, townhouses, and then we have, I think then if you, if you recalculate, I think you're at like 2% or something are three bedrooms. And I'm just wondering, um, do we as a city have a desired mix? Have we done any work to figure that out so that we can give direction to developers as they arrive at the ratios. Um, I know that the housing element says we need to build more family size units and certainly this place, um, this location, the site is, could not be better for um, families. Um, so I guess it's a, first a question to staff um, rather than the applicant to, to help us, help me understand how we arrive at these ratios and, and what, what is our desired mix as a city.
Yeah, I don't think we have, um, I mean, we don't have a, a specific mix that we ask applicants to provide. Uh, of course, we just, we analyze what applicants um, are proposing. Um, so I'm not sure if that, that answers the question. I guess I would, I would propose that it's something that we should probably have an answer to. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure what, how that would work. Um, maybe it's something that the city council should consider as we're looking at the housing element and what's the way to get to where we wanna go. Um, so then I would just say to the applicant that I would be interested in increasing the number of three bedrooms um, so that we do have the possibility of um, some families. And then my third, um, my third subject I'd like to cover is TDM, parking, um, all of that good stuff. Um, uh, I am certainly in favor of eliminating that surface parking and in favor of more important uses, whether it's pickleball, um, which I, I, I think, Commissioner Riggs, I would agree that we, we do need to consider pickleball, um, or more housing. Um, as far as TDM goes, uh, I agree with Commissioner Riggs, and I, I really am missing the, the wisdom of Commissioner Ducardi at this point, because I think what we really need to do is figure out what that number is. It's certainly not 20%. I think it's gonna need to be a reduction of at least 50%. And I guess what I would say is, what TDM reduction would it take to get rid of that parking lot number three? Um, it seems that it, we don't, to, to have a third parking lot just seems, I don't know, criminal in this area because we have, we're so close to so many other opportunities and resources um, and transit. So I guess what I, I would suggest is if, if, we could, we, if we could aim that that TDM is gonna be high enough such that we can reduce that parking lot, I think a lot of us are gonna feel a lot better about this project. And to boot, then you could move office site number one to where the, the, that parking lot is and you've got a whole bunch more space um, for housing. Um, so those are, those are my main uh, thoughts. Um, and, oh, I'd like to also thank the applicant I, or, or staff and or staff about the, the, my understanding is that we'll be putting a class four bike lane along Laurel um, commensurate with this project. And I, I hope that's really true because I think that's, that is really gonna be needed as we, we have so many kids now that bike along Laurel, but we're gonna have so many more um, once um, the tunnel is put in and once your amazing um, class one all the way around the uh, around your site, um, we're gonna have more students uh, on their bikes and which is terrific, but I wanna make sure that they're safe. Um, and of course, trying to, trying to understand for bikers that um, intersection of Laurel and Ravenswood which right now is, is uh, dangerous for the kids. So those are my comments. Again, thanks so much to both staff and the applicant. I appreciate your coming a third time on this. Um, and I know that we need to, we, we're all so in favor of this project and I know that we wanna get it moving as fast as possible. <clears throat> um, I see Commissioner Barnes all has a hand up. I do, thank you, Chair. And I wanted to uh, ask the applicant a question as it relates to parking and kind of tease out, if you would, Mr. Murray, the thesis behind the ratios you're putting in forward, how you're dividing them between uh, the different uses on your project. And if it were up to you and you weren't required. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more, unpack, if you would, why you have the parking you have and what's your um, thesis behind it. With commercial, because I think that's a little more salient given it's that's where, you know, the majority of the parking demand will come from. So what we proposed is two parking stalls for every thousand square feet. So we feel that's actually a pretty aggressive, um, pretty aggressive level of parking, even for transit oriented. I think if you look at the downtown specific plan, which obviously is 10 years old now, but I think it required 3.8 per thousand um, you know, with, with no ability to do in lieu fees. We th so we're being obviously far more aggressive than that. The challenge we have is 
really you need to make sure that your project is financeable and leasable. Uh, going below that, that two per thousand ratio really starts to affect that. That being said, we don't know exactly where things would be. We would love to have an approval that says, you know, assuming, you know, the, the sequence analysis can, can work with these types of variants that says, you know, you, you can build up, you can't build above two per thousand parking, but if you want to, you can go down to 1.5 stalls per thousand. Because as you can see from our site plan, you know, nearly all of the parking is structured parking. So, you know, a surface stall probably costs less than a thousand dollars to build. A structured stall is probably, you know, 50 to even $60,000. So if we have, if we go a full, you know, lab life sciences route on the entire development and that parking ratio drops to 1.5 and we can both finance and lease it with that lower parking rate, we save a million dollars essentially every 20 stalls we can get rid of. So from an economic standpoint, we're, we're incredibly aligned with reducing parking when feasible. I think we have to get through that first hurdle of making sure you have a financeable, leasable project. And that, that obviously has changed a lot over the last few years. I think 10 years ago, someone, you know, you asked the question, what's your minimum parking ratio? I think they'd say three per thousand in a minimum. So things are moving in the right direction. I expect them to continue to move in the right direction uh, in terms of less parking being required. But as it stands right now, I think we're kind of at the lower level where we feel comfortable this will be a, a viable project from a, from a financing standpoint. So the, the, the when feasible moment is when you're, when you're submitting your project pro formas and you've got a construction turning the perm, is, is that the when feasible? Is, or is there a moment after something's constructed where there's a practical application of the when feasible? So if you could just say that when feasible again, as you know, the gating, uh, yeah, yeah of course both. I, I, th I think at, you know, city council approval, for instance, we're, we're not going to know, right? You're, you haven't even begun a marketing process at the time you're getting approved. So you'll have a window of time as you're kind of designing building permit and things like that. And, and this will also be a phased project. So there's an opportunity there uh, with multiple parking garages where if you lease a certain percentage of the campus and you understand that density and then that last piece comes in that you know, say is a very low density use, like like an all lab user for the second half of the campus, you know, you could eliminate, you know, some or all of a, a parking deck that way. So whatever you can do to make it fluid over time in terms of our approvals is great. I, I think the challenge for us is it'll be very hard to say day one, we're getting approved. Hey, we're okay with 1.75, we're okay with 1.5. Uh, I think we're gonna, what we'd be saying unless something changes is, we need a 2.0, can we have the ability to drop down to 1.5 if, if not needed for our tenants and, and they're comfortable with that and you can eliminate parking that way. But, uh, and, and over time, right? Like if, if, it, if that's an approval for 25 years and 15 years from now with automation and things like that, this could be a two per thousand could seem crazy. You know, maybe we only need one per thousand and we can look at, you know, taking down parking decks and, and, and redeploying that to housing or, or anything else. Um, and then in, in reference to either modulating, modulating down, for instance, in this scenario, the footprint would essentially be the same. Uh, is it that the footprint of the garage would essentially be the same? It's the decks that you put on it. So whether you go to two or three or four, is that where the modulation comes in? Because you can't necessarily skinny up. You I, know, I once you have your exactly right, because because that way you could do it even even later in the game, right, where you're already you know, you've done your construction design, you can just kind of keep the same design and lower the, as opposed to redesign the deck, right? That could set right. you back a year in terms of, it's a completely different structure. Whereas a, a four level deck can drop to two levels without, without changing anything on the ground, foundations, things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's, the most, that's the most flexible thing you could do if you, you kind of change your mind later and want to do less parking. Awesome, and then if I could ask staff, and I'm not entirely sure, is that Ms. Sandemeyer or whomever would be the best to field this? Is there a flexible way to, to accommodate the desires of uh, future, you know, the desire of building in some flexibility at the uh, either entitlement, entitlement stage, which would allow for future flexibility to be able to modulate, for instance, if it's just decks, it's decks, 
so that they could not have to build things at future dates, which would in fact bring down the, the ratio, say of two to 1.5. Is that something that could be contemplated and would actually be actionable or practical to do from the city standpoint to allow that or work with the developer to facilitate that? Yeah, uh, through the chair, I, I'm not sure that I've seen um, anything structured like that, but I think it certainly could be possible since we're doing a new uh, zoning district and there will be, um, so there could be flexibility. Um, I think there could be flexibility built in if that's um, ultimately what the city council approves. Okay. And it certainly seems to make sense. Not, I mean, we can opine here uh, on on desires and wants for parking ratios, but the fact of the matter is, is we're not building it, we're not selling it, we're not leasing it, we're not financing it. But we want to see uh, appropriate parking ratios. So the to as this is a study session, and that it makes perfect sense from both a reduction in car trips, as is doable and the economics to not have to uh, build that parking to the extent we can build that into this, I think is certainly a worthy uh, aspect of the program to consider because you know we're trying to accommodate what the future may hold without knowing in fact what the future may hold. So I uh, thoroughly support that. Um, and then in closing, I'll say I support the EAR, which studies uh, update 100 units. I think that's the appropriate amount and I think that's the amount requested by the applicant on the upper range. So those are my two points. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barnes. It is uh, 9.26 p.m. I want to make sure that all the commissioners get um, their comments out. Um, at the same time, I, I, I want us, we do have three other things on the agenda. So um, please make sure if you do want to speak some more that you uh, let me know and um, we'll try to move this along. I see Commissioner Tate. Oh yes, I just wanted to um, to uh, clarify something, and that was the uh, study of additional units beyond the eight eight hundred. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Commissioner Riggs threw out a thousand, not seventeen hundred. And and I I think um, uh, Chair Harris, uh, you mentioned seventeen hundred. So I just wanted to throw that out there that I don't think that that's the number that we're looking at, you know, requesting to be analyzed. Thank you. Commissioner Riggs, did, what was the number that you had? Thank you. There, there were a couple of things I wanted to follow up quite briefly. And one of them was to suggest we get a sense of the commission, unquote, um, First and foremost, I wanted to make sure that there was a fourth alternative, not just the standard um, no project, base project, um, and bonus project that we typically see. In this case, um, the alternative was, uh, I think it was going to be 650 units. I think the other study should be something larger, but I am open to, in fact, I would like some feedback whether we should target 1,000 as something that's already larger than is likely to be built by this applicant, um, or the 1,700 that has been urged by multiple speakers because of the very, uh, the imbalance of the reference to uh, Facebook that doesn't have downtown and Caltrain and this site that does. Um, at this point, I'm leaning toward the additional EIR study option to be 1,000, uh, but I, I, I think perhaps this should be a uh, something we all weigh in on. Uh, and then I, I had one other very quick point when when we're ready for that. So I think um, per the EIR, I, I realize that we've already discussed this, but then things have, have changed. Um, and I think we all on this commission want to make sure that we're studying the right things. 
Uh, my understanding would be that the variant would be 800 because that is what the applicant is interested in, and that if we wanted to, we could have um, an alternate, is that the right word? Um, for um, for a greater number, if if that's if if we're interested in studying that, um, Mr. Biddle, I see you are here to answer all of those questions for us. I will do my best, Chair. Um, yes, the the applicant. I think we have a bit of confusion over terminology, and the applicant is proposing a variant to their main project, and the variant. Uh, actually two variants. And one of the variants is uh, initially was um, 600 additional or, or 600 residential units, which they've now indicated a uh, willingness to go up to 800 units. So that's the, the, the variant. We will also be um, undertaking an alternatives analysis, which is required by, by CEQA, uh, in the EIR, and it's a little bit, um, I would have to say, a little bit premature to be determining what the alternatives would be, whether it is um, an additional 1,000 units or 1,700 units, because the, the EIR is required to describe um, a range of what they refer to as reasonable alternatives to the project which would feasibly attain most of the basic objectives of the project, but would avoid or substantially lessen any of the significant effects of the project. And at this point, we don't know, we, we, we think we have ideas, what have you, but we don't know what the significant effects of the project are. And so the way the alternatives analysis is necessarily conducted is, it kind of comes later in the process of identifying, okay, what are the significant effects? What alternatives to the project that's being proposed by the applicant can we look at that while maybe attaining some of their, most of their objectives would avoid some of the significant effects. So we're, we're a little bit of the uh, getting the, the cart before the horse kind of thing here. And um, so while we can certainly do an alternatives analysis that um, would look at uh, a thousand units or 1700 units or whatever the, the number might be we're just really not there yet to make that sort of um, determination is that's my point okay thank you um at this point we are the recommending body for this um it will be going to the city council so i think um, the fact that we as a commission have stated that we are, I think most of us in line, I guess I should probably check in, in line of the variant of 800, but are interested in perhaps looking at some alternatives of numbers more like 1000 or 1700. I wonder, I think that's probably all that we maybe need to do tonight um, in order so that the city council will hear what we've have discussed. Do you disagree with that, oh, Commissioner Riggs? <laughs> or um, or add? Um, I'm inclined to disagree with it, but I will have to, through the chair, ask for staff uh, to verify this. I believe that there is an issue when we ask for an additional variant or an alternative to the variant, however we want to compartmentize these because there would understandably be extra cost to the AIR. But I think it is our intent that there be a fourth variant. And it is our intent that that fourth variant be significantly increased housing. And I, um, uh, again, I'm um, thinking of our missing seventh person. It is frustrating if we are not in a position to ask for that variant. So um, if I may ask Ms. Sandemeyer, is this commission not tasked with uh, defining the scope of the EIR, not recommending a scope to council, but are we not tasked with defining the scope? Um, so through the chair, as I understand it, it's up to the applicant to determine the variance. Um, 
because that's part of their proposal. And then the alternatives are part of the EIR CEQA um, process. And maybe um, Mr. Biddle from uh, the city attorney's office can add to that. No, I, I think you got it right, Corinna. Um, it, it's the applicant's project. And so the, the project is as presented and they are also interested in studying a couple of variants. So it's their, it's their determination to be made. We nevertheless, the city commission, the council do have the ability to, um, as I say, analyze alternatives, which are not the same at the same level of detail and description as the as a variant, but it would be an alternatives analysis uh, in the EIR, and it could uh, could be if, you know a thousand units, seventeen hundred units, uh, to the extent that that um, might avoid or lessen significant impacts of the project that's being proposed by the applicant. Thank you for that. You know, my frustration um, with these alternatives is th that we're looking for something that would um, mitigate some of the issues with the project, but we don't we don't look at well, what are the benefits of doing more, right? Like we're not looking at oh, well, actually, then people aren't going to be driving in um, from Modesto to work uh, at a restaurant in Menlo Park. We don't look at the the positive. Generally, my understanding is we don't look as much at the positives as we do um, at. I guess what somebody might consider negatives. So I, 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 if we want to look at an alternative, I'm interested in doing that. I just, it's my own frustration, like um, Commissioner Ducardi before me with the, with the EIR process. Um, so I guess having said that, I would be open certainly to looking at an alternative of a much greater number. Um, but for, but for tonight, I know what we do need to do is um, just help the applicant feel. Um, that their variant of 800 is something that, in general, we're supportive of. We're not taking a vote tonight on it, but I think he's heard from enough of us that we're in general support of that. Um, so did, uh, Commissioner Riggs, did, did you get what you needed from that, or do you have some other suggestion? Well, it's not entirely clear to me, but I think I heard uh, that while the variant is proposed by the applicant, the alternatives are directed by this commission. And in this case, I think we want a, uh, an alternative. The question is whether it's 1,000 or it's been suggested 1,700. Um, and I thought we might try to get a sense of the six commissioners if, if the chair would like that. Otherwise, I will, I will simply say for myself, um, I think 1,000 is a reasonable augmentation to study as an alternative in the EIR. Um, Commissioner Tate, you were the other um, the other commissioner who was uh, discussing numbers on this. So, what what was what what would make you feel the most comfortable for an alternative? What is your proposal? Um, so, I know that uh, many residents are still making that comparison with. Willow Village at the 1700 units. I'm comfortable really with 1200 um, as, a, as a maximum. I, um, so 1200 as a cap, as a top, or yeah, I would be fine with that. Okay. Um, can I go back to, um, I don't know if it's Mr. Biddle or um, Ms. Sandmeyer. My understanding is that that the, uh, is, is this determined by our body or by the city council ultimately? Because I know that they are having a meeting on this um, at the end of the month. Yeah, so the, the meeting um, that we'll be having with city council is just to discuss the scope Kind of the scope of the EIR and go over the um, NOP comments. But basically the alternatives are, um, are there to mitigate impacts. So I think first the, 
the first step is to start the um, draft EIR and figure out what the impacts would be. And then, um, and then the uh, alternatives are determined to be studied. But, but the, it won't be coming back to our, to the planning commission. So if we, if we don't say something now, then we're, they're not going to get studied, correct? Feel free to jump in, Mr. Biddle. Ah, thank you. Sorry. Um, again, I, I would just note that a couple things. One, again, it's I believe we're it's premature to be deciding this issue. Uh, I would also note that your your agenda for tonight's meeting is really focused on the study session of the project, um, and and we're now crossing over into aspects of the of the scope of the EIR and and the that sort of whole comment period and the and the commission's um, comment on that 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 uh, was completed uh, in January 9th and so you know that is really not clearly on tonight's agenda um, uh, but again I think what I uh, indicated earlier is that it, it's kind of premature to be having that discussion doing the alternatives analysis you know EIR is much further down the road um, and so we can certainly um, come back uh, when we're at that stage of identifying what the alternatives are to have this uh, discussion we can have it properly uh, notice and agendize uh, in compliance with the Brown Act um, so I want to make sure we you know proceed correctly in that regard um, and again, I just think tonight is a little bit premature to be making decisions about what alternatives analysis is going to be conducted in the EIR. Okay, thank you for that. So, uh, yes, I, I, I see that we this is not agendized. So I guess given that we are all pretty interested in this, I think it, it would be good to agendize it um, for a, a date in the future so that we can discuss this some more because I think I, I'm getting the sense that we're not all perfectly satisfied with this. Um, and I know we need to um, not discuss it if it's not on the agenda. Um, Commissioner Bartz. Yes, and I, I get the, the desire to bend process to um, advocate for 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 discussion i i really want to bifurcate out um preferences in terms of unit count from what we're charted with tonight um and um uh, i guess mr biddle summed it up it's just it, as frustrated as you may be uh i'm also on this end frustrated because we're trying to bend a CEQA EIR process to something which is not fitting what it is. I think the narrative is trying to be, and it's it's a square peg and a round hole. And I think, um, and it's frustrating on this end as well. So I I, I agree that it's time to move on to another item. Although uh, that's not to diminish the comments, but it's this isn't the right place for this particular line of discussion. Um, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so I think what we're gonna okay, Commissioner Riggs. <laughs> I apologize. I'll, I'll be brief. I'll just go on record that um, staff and the consultant will do what they will, but if this commission decides in the future to uh, request a 1,000 dwelling unit project or a 1,200 dwelling unit project, and this has to go back for an EIR revision, then perhaps that's the process that staff would prefer. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. And then I wanted to make a, a brief comment about um, the parking ratio being aggressive at two per thousand. It, it is aggressive for um, a project that is not immediately adjacent to this level of transportation and, um, and support, uh, not just restaurants, but banking and so forth. Um, and I'll point out that um, 
where real density is concerned, whether it's Manhattan or portions of San Francisco, like the financial district, the ratio is zero per thousand. So there's a lot of room left in between zero and two. Um, and I think we just have to be um, open to the possibility of less parking. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Okay, with that, uh, you know, if if I recall, the, at the last meeting, the, the thing that we ended with was parking. And now tonight, I think we're going to again um, end this study session with a reminder that we are interested in reducing the parking. Um, so let's, let's take a break. We're going to close this item. And when we come back, we will uh, move on to the public hearings of G2. G1 has been continued. So um, we'll be moving on to G2. So let's take a five minute break. It's 945. Let's come back at 950. Thank you so much. Okay, welcome back to those listening later. Um, we're now gonna move on to item G2 on the agenda, which is consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit to demolish an existing one-story single-family residence and construct a new two-story single-family residence on a substandard lot with regard to the minimum lot width and area in the R1U, single-family urban residential zoning district at 440 University Drive. The project includes an attached accessory dwelling unit, ADU, which is a permitted use not subject to discretionary review. Determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. Um, before I'd like to go and ask staff, uh, I just wanted, I forgot to do this. I just wanted to thank everybody who's here in the audience and I'm sorry that you had to listen for so long on that first item, but we are moving on now and we really needed to get through it because this is their third time. So I, I appreciate, I, I acknowledge that you guys have been here and I really appreciate it, both you and the folks on Zoom. So now um, st uh, for staff uh, or the applicant, is there a um, presentation on this item G2? Good evening, Acting Chair Harris and Commissioners. Um, I do not have any updates to the staff report, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. And then I know um, the applicant does have a brief presentation. Are there any questions for staff on this item or should we go to the applicant? Okay, seeing none, um, please. Ms. Felbert, I think you're on mute. Um, does Ms. Felber need to be promoted? Oh, there she goes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and members of the commission. I'm Anna Felber with Thomas James Holmes, and I'm gonna keep it really brief as I know we've all been here pretty late, but I'll be presenting 440 University Drive. Um, there we go. Site context 440 is off of university in between middle and college. Uh, there's a little uh, red dot showing where 440 is. Uh, to the right adjacent are pretty significant tree line on the adjacent lot and um, some redwoods that you can see at the rear of the lot. Um, just wanted to give some context. Uh, multifamily is off of middle street to the left of our property in a park. Zooming into the site, just showing uh, the layout of it uh, facing University Drive, whereas uh, the lots behind and right adjacent are facing either College or Middle Avenue. The red outline is showing an existing house in that L shape and our new proposed home, uh, the relationship to with the new proposed home. There were, uh, oops, there we go. Uh, it's an L shape, which is similar to the existing home, trying to create that private outdoor space on the left rear edge there, um, which was previously um, part of the existing um, home. Uh, so that relationship is something that was important to maintain. You can see there's a garage on the left adjacent lot. So there's a, an edge there um, that allows that uh, our property ha to have private outdoor living space. 
diving into that image a little bit more, the image on the right is the proposed lot. Just wanted to make note of setbacks. Uh, they're light gray shaded areas, the first floor, and the dark gray is our second floor. Uh, the porch of our proposed home is at the 20 foot front minimum setback. Uh, living space at the ADU and the garage are, are articulated and set back a little bit more. Uh, on the right edge, we go from a five foot setback to a nine foot towards the rear to provide some relief along that edge and that and that tree canopy there. Um, also to centralize the, the second floor massing. On the left edge, we go from an eight foot setback um, all the way back. And then that second floor on both sides set back a little over 12 feet um, to keep it more centralized, to reduce that massing, to have that nice setback. Um, towards the rear, again, there's a notch cut out of the plan to allow for that left um, private outdoor space. And we're about that wall left corner is about 35 feet away from the property line. And then on the right is 20 foot, 10 inches away from that property line. It snuggles into that back corner where those larger trees, the redwood trees, and then of course the canopy is on that right side. And just one to note about the trees. Um, there are eight trees being removed, which are on X's on the left image, a little hard to see, uh, but they're not protected. We're not removing any protected significant trees on the site, but we did want to add to um, the tree canopy. So you'll see in that right image that we have a 24 inch box up front. Um, that's to continue that street line of trees. We've added two on the left edge to continue the canopy that's along that area and to, to allow for more privacy between um, our left adjacent neighbor and our home. And then two trees in the back that don't interfere with, with the existing canopy that's already back there. And then I'm just gonna skip ahead um, to the floor plans to show we're proposing a three bedroom, two and a half bath. But as you can see hatched um, in that left image, the ADU is a one bedroom, one bath that we're also proposing attached to this home. Uh, there's a two car garage also attached. And just wanna talk a little bit about materials before I end the short presentation. There are a lot of siding and stucco in the neighborhood. We wanted to go with um, siding. The original uh, home that's on site was actually a white painted horizontal siding traditional home um, across the street and left adjacent there are um, traditional homes uh, there's a farmhouse across the street as well so the siding and this traditional style uh, we thought would blend well with this neighborhood um, and then we have a little bit of brick at that um, garage area on the first story only um, to give a little bit of a texture change um, as it would still be the white uh, off-white um, to match the body color and we have dark accents um, to go along with that, to highlight the, the front door and the garage and the window frame. And our team is here, that's that's it for our presentation, but our team is here. We have our architect, Jamie mather Mazalan, and um, another member of our TJH team here tonight to answer any questions you may have on this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, cl clarifying questions from the commission before we move to public comment on this item? Okay, um, so at this point, I'd like to move to public comment on this uh, on this item. Mr. Pruder. Thank you, Chair Harris. Uh, at this time, uh, we have public comment for this item and members of the public are welcome to, if they are virtually participating, press the hand icon on their Zoom interface or if calling by phone, press star nine. Um, at this moment, I don't see any hands raised but uh, we did receive one comment card in person for a comment, and I can introduce them at this time if you'd like. Please. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, our one uh, public commenter in person here uh, with the name Elizabeth. You're welcome to uh, approach the podium at this time, and you may provide your public comment. Uh, again, if you'd like, uh, you don't have to, but you may provide your name and address uh, as well. Thank you. And you have three minutes to speak. Thank you.
person. And I kept hearing you talk about the SRI project in terms of, you know, this is a one-time opportunity to develop a space for a longer term goal. And I feel like this is my only chance to impart upon you what I feel about this project and Thomas James Homes. They are an out of area developer. They buy up properties, they tear down houses, and they put up monster homes. You talked about affordable housing in the SRI um, presentation, and this has an ADU, but it's attached. So functionally, it's part of the house. This is not an ADU, it's an attached ADU. It's an additional bedroom, it's not an ADU. Don't let them get away with it. They are um, putting up a massive house. They showed a slide that they didn't show me. They met with me and my neighbor over Zoom. The plans that they presented to you are not the plans they presented to us. So I feel like there's some deception there. And I really want to say that the things that I object most about the house is that if you look at the plans, it is a 21.8 or 21.8 inches setback from the street when they're allowed a 20 foot setback. Yet, I would love it if the house were two feet further away from my back fence. Um, instead of looming 26, seven, seven point whatever, who knows what the actual end up height is going to be because I'm not quite sure of their numbers. Um, looming over my house, my yard, being able to see into my yard from their monster house 20 feet from the property line. Even the ability to move the house toward the street the a maximum amount and away from my property is I believe in your discretion. The fact that if you look at the back of the house, there is a little bit of a setback, but in truth, I'm looking at a wall that is higher than this ceiling, this far from my fence. Um, and in addition, they are putting a patio that's to the fence line. The planting that they have um, put in the plan doesn't have any plans over three feet on that back fence, even though there's already uh, a current camphor tree there that'll at least block some of this house. It is my hope that you will ask them to go back to the drawing board to limit the impacts on the neighbors. It is a cookie cutter, you know, wedding cake house where the entire back of the house is the entire height. If they would make the front of the house flatter and the back of the house a little more recessed on the second floor, that would even help impacts. But they're not willing to talk to me about any design changes because they're within guidelines. And I'm imploring you to help me as a neighbor who has lived in Menlo Park since the better part of my life since 1964, the house that I was able to afford in the 90s, and they are forever going to change the, my ability to um, put another house at the back of my property because it will be overseen by this house. And I would really appreciate it if you would look at me. I'd really appreciate it if you would look at me because I'm imploring you to help me lessen the impacts on my home that I've been in since the 90s. Really, they can do better. Thomas James can do better. It's not an ADU, it's part of the main house. The landscaping plan could be bettered so that it doesn't impact my yard so much that there's more screening instead of three foot high plants at the back fence. So what my, my preference is that you ask them to move the house forward as much as they can on the lot, to look at setting the primary bedroom back a few feet and um, to put in some more screening plants. I know this, and if they can you're, lower the height of the house, please lower the height of the house. Okay, thank you, you're, you're um, over time, so I have to. Yes, I know, and because, I, and you I know. And I appreciate that you, uh, I think all of us were typing so furiously that we weren't looking straight at you. So I do appreciate you you mentioning and reminding us, but thank you, your, your time is now up. Is there, um, I, I, is there anybody else um, to comment tonight on this item? Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for coming and staying in person for so long <laughs> tonight.
Thank you, Chair Harris. I, I do not see any other hands raised. Okay. Uh, no one else has brought comment cards at this time. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, so we're gonna move it back to the commission for um, comments um, and potential questions, um, thoughts. Who would like to, and ultimately some sort of motion, who, who would like to start us off? Uh, Commissioner Riggs. Yes, I have a uh, question about the glazing on the stairwell windows. Um, I believe that uh, that is the left side, uh, if that's Ms. Houck's uh, side, perhaps. Uh, but um, I would just like clarity, uh, as, as we pretty much always ask about um, privacy impacts, and w in particular with stairwell windows, given the um, approach that you make to the landing from above uh, and get quite a view. Um, could we just clarify, um, maybe, I guess this would be directed to you, Mr. Turner, uh, what is the glazing on those windows? So according to the plans, um, it doesn't look like there's any obscure glass, it's just normal window glazing. All right, thank you. Other commissioners, or did you have more? Commissioner Riggs. Well, I wanted to give other commissioners a chance to speak. Uh, uh, lacking that, I'll make a motion. Okay, um, Commissioner Doe. Oh, thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, I just, I believe 883 is to the rear, is to the, it's uh, not next door, but to the rear. Um, and I just, I had a question to the applicant um, and just understanding the, I, I understand that the, um, the proposed home was all within the city guidelines, but just for the sake of, um, you know, qualitative contextual sensitivity, I just want to understand, was there at least a um, quick sun study to show the worst case scenario of the house and, um, you know, winter or afternoon sunlight, does it block access? Um, and I know that doesn't necessarily address the aesthetic impacts, but, and, and again, I understand that um, the project doesn't, um, break any rules, but just to be sensitive to the context. We did not uh, put together a solar study. Um, we have dropped the house, um, the second floor plate height from a nine foot to an eight seven. Um, so we did drop a few inches there to lower that wall height. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe that was did, is that correct to the applicant? Uh, we did not put together a solar study. Is that what you were asking? Um, actually, I thought you were, I thought Christian Riggs was referring to the, the dropping the, the height. I'm, I'm sorry, your audio is, not at all clear, so we weren't sure whether you said you dropped the plate height on that side or whether you could drop <clears throat> the plate on that side. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm coming in clear. Uh, originally, the entire second floor plate height was higher um, at a 9-1, and we dropped it the entire second floor to an 8-7. So there was a bit of change in height, but not necessarily any um, uh, solar study being done to to um, to show the effects on that rear lot. We did, the last time we had a conversation with the rear neighbor, we did show that we were 78 feet away from the main house. So I know that there is um, a rear ADU on that lot as well. That's 78 feet from our our house corner to that, that neighboring lot, which is quite significant um, in what we've come across in our experience with other neighbors. The public comment period is now over, is now over. So unfortunately, we have questions to the applicant at this point. Okay. 
keep on with your questioning. Um, so uh, again, uh, through the chair, Mr. Turner, is is there also an ADU structure that is not shown on the vicinity plan on our sheet A7 and the architect's sheet uh, AP1? Is there a structure that is missing from this plan? It doesn't appear. So if you look at the context map on the page before the area plan, it may be obscured by the trees. Um, I don't believe there's a structure there. I think it would have shown up um, at least a faint outline on the survey. Um, so I don't think there's one directly behind that right. property line. It may be closer to the, the main oh, residence. Thank you. I, I'm sorry to people in the audience. We cannot accept just random discussion from the audience. There's a there's a pattern here, and public comment is closed. I'm sorry about that. Um, so I would like to make a motion on this project. I would okay. like to move approval of the project, but with the um, stipulation that the stairwell. Uh, have obscure glass. Obscure meaning, of course, anything that um, could, any texture that could be chosen that is not uh, completely vision clear. Thank you. Do we have a second or more discussion from the commissioners? Would anybody like to second or provide some more? commentary or questions i you know i cannot see commissioner barnes and commissioner tate on my screen so if you have a comment please um use your voice i'm very sorry but the public comment is over so we need to focus it at the Okay, Commissioner Schindler. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of sitting here ruminating about the, the I support um, moving ahead with the proposal, but I'm oh, just thinking about the re requirement of making the window opaque. Um, I think that this is, I'm sorry, perhaps perhaps I misunderstood. Commissioner Riggs, could you re repeat the, the, the sure. addition that you made to the, to the Obscure motion? glass is anything uh, that you cannot see a clear image through. So uh, frosted glass is the most mundane of those, um, but any, any texture in the casting of the glass, and if you go to a glass shop, they might have 30 or 40 textures, including something that looks like it's wet. Um, all of those are constitute obscure glass and that way you don't have a privacy issue but you can still see the green of leaves and the brown of trunks and the blue of sky so would that include glass options like beveling seated glass yes frosted yes yeah I, I will I will second Commissioner Riggs motion Are you fucking kidding me? okay I Okay, I'm going to have to ask you to. <laughs> I understand. Okay, we're going to have to take a vote at this point. We have a first and a second. Um, so, oh, Commissioner Barnes, did you have um, something to say? Yes, and, and as we go through this process, I'm just, I can't help 
but be struck by conversations we had a couple of weeks ago where we decide, well, I, the um, sentiment among uh, commissioners was not, for instance, to have any type of objective design standards on lots. And we, you know, we've got an individual here uh, who's looking to build one house on a lot, whereas we've decided not to have any objective design standards on, for instance, an adjoining lot, which could have four new houses on it, four dwellings on it. And if we think that um, that was a great decision, I mean, I think we can expect to see a lot more of what we just saw now where people are going uh, berserk um, and we've got no discretionary review before to, for putting four. So I think it's discriminatory against the individuals who are just trying to do one house. Um, whereas people who can do four houses don't have any type of discretionary review. So uh, as I listen to the exercised individual in the audience, I'm just struck by that, um, that concept. And I wish we would reconsider that. But that's not for here. That's a comment about uh, this project. So, yeah. okay. Okay. Right so on. at this point, we're going to have to take a vote on this project. So, um, uh, Commissioner Barnes. Uh, I abstain. Okay. Um, Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. I'm abstaining also. Okay. Um, I am going to also vote yes. So that is four. Um, so the motion passes. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to um, G3, which is to consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit to demolish an existing one one story single family residence and detached accessory building and construct a new two story single family residence on a substandard lot with regard to lot width, depth, and area in the R1U single family urban residential zoning district at 167 McKindry Drive. Determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. So to staff, do we have a presentation um, or from the applicant, please? I'm recused from this item. So Barnes is going to go off um, camera. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you, Chair Harris. I am the project planner for this project. So I'm switching with uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Turner over there for the clerk for now. So I'm here for any questions you have. There is one update I'd like to provide earlier today. We had given, um, I'm sorry, can, can everyone hear me okay? okay? We can, thank you. Sorry about that. Earlier today, we had a uh, comment that was emailed to us, which I circulated to the planning commissioners uh, regarding some concerns from a neighbor um, regarding uh, privacy and tree planting matters uh, along the side of uh, the property facing that neighbor's property. And uh, at this time, I'm here for any questions. Um, and we also have the uh, project applicant team in person um, for some opening remarks if there are no questions for staff. Thank you. Um, if there are no questions, are there any questions for clarifying questions for staff at this time? Okay, then I would like to invite the applicant to come and if, if they'd like to say a few words, it's not, it's not, you don't have to, but you're welcome. Uh, my name is Eiki Tanaka with Studio Zero Two Architects. Uh, I'd just like to thank the commissioners for hearing and considering this project and staff for preparing the report. Um, I just wanted to come up here and uh, first answer any questions you guys might have um, and just to address the, the comment from the neighbor that was brought up um, uh, regarding privacy. Uh, the, the neighbor is the one to the right. Um, and just to give full context, um, the neighbor had 
privacy concerns. So um, as an accommodation, uh, the, the bedrooms that are facing that side, we did change the window sizes um, to raise the sill heights to a level where we can't, the, the occupant wouldn't be able to see inside. Um, and I think what we couldn't come to an agreement was the, the stairwell windows, kind of similar to what Commissioner Riggs brought up with the previous project. Um, I think uh, just maybe it might be new information, but uh, we'd like the commissioners to um, just consider uh, to add as a condition of approval that we're willing to do obscure windows for the lower windows of the stairwell while we keep the upper windows um, clear. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Are there any clarifying questions before we move to public comment on this item? Okay, seeing none, um, I'd like to move to public comment on this um, item. Are there any either hands raised on Zoom or um, cards from the audience in person? Yes, we have one card and um, I'd just like to remind everybody if you on Zoom, if you'd like to give public comment, uh, please click the raise hand button um, and that will let us know you would like to give public comment on this item. We will start with the in-person public comment. Then um, Alex Lee, you have the opportunity to give public comment. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alex Lee, and uh, as uh, Zoom mentioned earlier, I'm actually the resident on 171 McKendry, which is, um, as, uh, as you guys have mentioned, that actually we are the next door neighbors um, that had uh, raised the concern. Um, I guess, uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, the members of the commission this evening uh, for actually um, giving us the opportunity to speak and also for the late hour. Um, I'd like to thank the staff, actually, of the, of the planning department for always providing amazing support. Um, and we also like to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Ryan Chang, the owner, uh, to our Willows neighborhood as well. I mean, we are actually longtime residents of the Willows. And um, as it was pointed out, uh, we have uh, the primary reason why I'm here today is to actually raise concerns about the stairway windows. And um, we had raised this concern earlier on, primarily because the way it's currently set up, it's a fairly large window. It's about five feet wide and nine feet tall. And the way it's set up is such that it is about three and a, 3, 3 feet and two inches to three feet to nine inches from the stairway landing. So it's about, yeah, high. This is where the window starts. So that means that any adult or even an older child who kind of walks through that stairway, when they look out, they actually have a direct line of sight on our backyard as well as our site. As I'm showing in illustration one and two, you kind of have a sense of what kind of visibility that somebody who in the stairway would have on our property. And as we look actually forward, if we choose eventually to also build out to a second floor, that also becomes, it makes the problem even worse because anybody who's standing on the second floor looking out to the stairway would have a clear view into our property, side and backyard. And that is the reason why we had raised concerns. The current proposed plan to actually plant the three uh, strawberry trees, um, I have raised this concern with um, uh, with Mr. Chang that uh, you would be inadequate. Um, I think the 15 gallon proposed trees would only be about six feet, which is about the height of the fence. And as you can see from illustration one and two, it wouldn't be blocking any um, of the direct eye, uh, line of sight. And we had also raised concern about the type of tree because a strawberry tree grows very wide, drops a lot of fruits, it gets very messy. So I'm stuck between I need to trim back hard, but if I trim back hard, then I'm going to lose the, the privacy screening. Um, so that's a, a strong uh, concern that we had raised. And therefore, we have restated that uh, we have a strong preference for an obscure glass option, because I think for shorter term and long term, I think it's a win-win situation. 
Um, if there is a tree option that, that would like to be explored, we would actually ask that at least from day one that it provides adequate uh, coverage so we don't have to wait for the tree to grow. So just kind of wrap me up. I mean, we would love Sorry. to be able to find a win-win situation. I, thank here. you so much. I'm, I just realized that you, you're uh, quite a bit over the time, so I'm yeah. gonna have to cut you off here. But yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your consideration. Okay, um, are there any comments or questions from the commission or ultimately a motion? Commissioner Doe. Thank you, Vice Chair Harris. Um, so we heard from the applicant the proposal of obscure glass halfway, and but it wasn't clear to me. Um, I don't know if we typically ask neighbors to the applicant, but it, it wasn't clear to me if um, that would satisfy in your conversations with the, the neighbor's concerns if the halfway obscure glass was sufficient to address the privacy concerns. And, and to the app to the applicant I just want to make sure that that's been um, you know resolved with the the neighbor yeah we we actually haven't discussed the halfway obscure option um, we kind of went down the tree screening route um, and then I think we somewhat hit a dead end there so I think just today I think in response um we the owner uh was saying he'd be interested in the obscure glass route just not all the way up thank you okay any other comments or ultimately a motion okay. commissioner riggs um yes uh, through the chair i uh, may i ask also a question of the applicant Yes, you may. Um, so to, uh, I don't know if it would be Mr. Tanaka who would determine the uh, tree, lo uh, tree species, but um, I know a strawberry tree can be quite a challenge. Um, it's the dropped fruit um, ends up tracking into your house among other things. Um, and I just wondered, were you open to perhaps working with staff to choose um, uh, another tree, uh, not necessarily to solve the privacy question at the upper level, but to provide just first floor privacy? Would you, for example, uh, entertain uh, the pistache tree or, um, or something else? Yeah, we, we are open to um, non-fruit bearing trees, um, evergreens, um, so yeah. I think the, the size was the bigger um, item of contention, I think, uh, because I think in their email they had asked for something along the lines of 13 feet, which ends up being quite large to bring in onto the site, and um, we weren't sure logistically how that would work out in the first place. And, Yes, understood. It, there really are two issues here, and, and I agree. A, a, a tree is especially not in the first year going to solve the problem, and probably not in the first five or six. <clears throat> Thank you. So um, if I may, I'd like to uh, make a motion <clears throat> to approve the project um, uh, to adopt the resolution approving the use permit. Um, with the condition that the, um, the stairwell glass lower section, which I think is somewhat more than a half, um, be obscure glass as proposed by the applicant, and that the applicant work with staff to uh, look at alternative tree selections that might be more amenable to a neighbor. Thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Do we have a second for that motion? I'll second that one. Commissioner Tate, thank you so much for the second. If there's no other, is there any other, uh, any other commissioners wanna speak? If not, we'll take a vote. Okay, let's take a vote. Um, 
Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. And I'm also a yes. So uh, we, let's see, five, we have five um, yeses and one recusal. So the motion passes. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming and staying. Next, we're going to move on to G4. Uh, consider and adopt a resolution to approve a use permit to demolish an existing one-story single-family residence and construct two new two-story residences on a substandard lot with regard to the minimum lot width in the R2 low density apartment district at 785 Partridge Avenue. <clears throat> the project would also include excavation in the interior side and rear setbacks for light wells associated with basements. Determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines section 15303's class three exemption for new construction or conversion of small structures. Additionally, the proposal includes administrative review of a minor subdivision to subdivide the project into two condominium units. So do we have a staff report, Ms. Fatine, on this item and or uh, the applicant to speak? Uh, good evening, commissioners and members of the public. Um, there is an update to the, not the staff report, but to the condition of approval. So with that, if we could move on to the next slide, I would like to read out the condition of approval for the record. Simultaneous with the submittal of a complete building permit application, the applicant shall submit a revised arborist report detailing guidelines for root preservation for trees number two and three, Douglas firs, located at 817 Partridge Avenue. In addition to detailed instructions on excavation methods and monitoring, the guidelines shall specify alternative driveway construction techniques and or materials to preserve roots of trees number two and three within 12 feet of their trunks and state that no roots greater than or equal to two inches in diameter shall be cut within 12 feet of trees trunks. The revised arborist report shall be subject to review and approval by the city arborist and planning division. With that, I conclude my update. Uh, I believe the applicant team is here in person as well as uh, virtually in attendance today. Calvin Smith, who is the applicant uh, as noted in the project, is unavailable this, after, this evening. However, we have Jose on his behalf and Eugene who is uh, online with us as well. I believe the applicant team does have a, a quick presentation for the commission tonight. Okay, thank you. You're welcome to, to begin. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, I'm Jose Ares uh, from Studios Square Architecture, and I wanted to thank the commissioners for the time today and consideration of this project, so the planning department for their support. And um, just, uh, we are excited to, um, Proposed like this uh, this design for like these two new homes uh, on this um, very nice neighborhood. Um, we feel that like the design that we are proposing is gonna enhance the actual uh, very nice street of this this house and also provide like some very nice um, unneeded housing, even if there's more scale. But yeah, if we can go into the next slide, um, we have done our research uh, of all those. Um, kind of like email the plans for to all those different like neighbors. And then we go to the next slide. Uh, we got responses uh, from the, the neighbors that uh, are including a, a yellow circle there. So um, going to the next slide, um, we have just um, record for like some of the certified mail. And then in the next slide, uh, we have just some photos of when we were like uh, dropping the, the different mail with the plans. So uh, in the next slide, uh, here, uh, these are like some of the comments that we were receiving from uh, the different neighbors. And uh, I didn't want to focus uh, too much right now on the comments because we can happy to have to go over like any clarification later. 
but in the next slide, um, there are some of the responses, um, like the previous from this one, sorry. Um, there are some of the responses uh, to those specific questions, and we are in agreement with like uh, also the support that the planning department has been providing uh, and responses to, to the neighbors. So um, if you go to the next slide, uh, this is just one aspect that we wanted to uh, clarify with regards to the privacy in between the subject property and the, uh, the house on the left, uh, that we are locating like all the seals for all the upper windows at six feet from finished floor. Uh, so we feel that just because of the height of the seal of all those windows, uh, the only visibility is gonna be like the sky and possibly a little bit of a glimpse of the roof. Uh, but there's gonna be, that's gonna allow like a very, very good like privacy in between the two homes. Um, in the next slide, um, here it was just a study uh, for, we wanted to make sure that like the, the house, the two houses, but especially the houses facing the street was gonna feel well in, in context. So we studied uh, in the next slides, we studied like the, uh, the houses uh, in, the, um, in the neighborhood uh, to make sure that we were introducing like elements like the gables, uh, whereas the, the materials we use siding, um, stucco, um, even like uh, in the next slides, uh, we also have like uh, details like the window grid. So like even if the designs that we are proposing are slightly more modern, uh, we are still taking into consideration um, the main architectural features uh, that we were seeing in the context and then implementing those features into the design. In the next slide, um, here is a photo of the existing home that right now is a um, two-car garage facing the street. And we feel that the new device design is gonna enhance a lot like the view of the, from the street. In the next slide, um, we have the footprint of the existing home. And uh, here we are indicating the existing trees to remain, the trees that we are proposing to remove because of the footprint of the, the development. Uh, in the next slide, here uh, it's just like a slide to show compliance with the uh, maximum prior limits, the setbacks. Uh, in the next slide, we are showing um, the compliance with regards to the one car garage, the two uh, outdoor parking spaces that create like a very nice separation between the two houses. And then in the next slide, here uh, we are showing an elevation where um, more than like indicating like that we are in compliance with the maximum height is more uh, kind of like when we were understanding the, the context, uh, we're feeling that like it would be nice to have the driveway on the right side to move the mass of the house more towards the left uh, to create like that scale down in between like the, the house on the left towards the apartment building on the right and having a little bit more separation uh, in between uh, those, those two, two buildings. And then we also wanted that, that the mass towards the street wasn't like very present. So we only have like one bedroom towards the street and then like the rest of the mass on the second floor is set back and like changes with a different material um, to make sure that there's not, it's not gonna feel like massive from the street. Um, then in the next slide, uh, is like that same view, but for the house in the right, uh, on, on the back, it's uh, very similar mass, very similar volumes, but the house moves to the right to allow for more natural light coming into the back here of the house on the left. Then in the next slide, um, these are just like the um, material boards for the two houses. Uh, we are planning to propose uh, very durable materials like um, fiber, cement, port and button, uh, metal roof face in the street, um, and then in the next house, uh, also stucco uh, and some fiber cement siding. Uh, that will be on the next next slide, uh, where we also have developed like this study where like very very durable materials just to make sure that like even um, if maintenance you know is not yeah like just to make sure that it's gonna look great like with the pass of the years. Um, so the next slide. Um, the next slides are just for the floor plans. Uh, we pretty much have like one bedroom, one bathroom on uh, the basement. If we go to the next slide, we'll have uh, one bedroom, one bathroom on the main floor with the great room and the garage. And then in the next slide, we'll have 
two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Uh, the next three slides uh, are the same, so we can. Uh, it's just like the same, but like the basement is a slightly the, the light will be slightly lighter on this one. So we can go through the next two slides. Um, yeah, one bedroom, one bathroom in the main house, in the main level, and then two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Uh, in the last slides, uh, if we go to the next one, like here's just like one small um, variation that we did from the planning application, that uh, initial planning application. I wanted to make sure uh, that to address the concern from the neighbor in the back, uh, we we're going to provide nice privacy with us to the trees. And we were proposing uh, in the back, like those two trees uh, at the top, um, two ginkgo trees, but those uh, were not going to be good for privacy. So in the next slide, uh, we change those and we have been coordinating with the landscape designer to make sure that those are uh, uh, tr uh, pine trees uh, instead of um, ginkgo trees. So make sure like the, the privacy is going to be there with evergreen trees. Um, yeah, with this, uh, like the next slide, uh, just is the last one uh, where we're just um, like on the house on the left, that in the screen, that is the, the one faces faces the front. Wanted to incorporate like a slightly more traditional style with the modern farm house, but still uh, having a little bit more of the warmth uh, with like some wood accents, and then reducing the contrast that normally happens in most of the modern farm house styles uh, to blend a little bit more uh, with the context and with, within itself without less less concerning. The one on the right is a little bit more, it's very traditional in shape, but uh, kind of like following the transitional style where the details are a bit more modern. And because it's not visible from the street, we thought we could go a bit more modern, but still it's very, in shape it's very traditional. So with that, I uh, just wanted to thank you uh, for your consideration. And um, yeah, uh, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you. It was very thorough and easy to understand. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, before we go to public comment, I'd like to ask if anyone on the commission has any clarifying questions for either staff or um, the applicant at this point. And I cannot see um, Commissioner Barnes or Commissioner Tate at this point. So if you have a clarifying question, please. Um, I do not, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so let's move to public comment on this item. Do we have any public commenters at this point? Thank you, Chair Harris. At this time, we have some written uh, public comment card requests. Uh, I'll begin with those names shortly. I just wanted to remind the members of the public uh, if they wanted to speak uh, from virtual Zoom um, access, they can raise their hand or press star nine if they're calling by phone. We do have a virtual hand raised uh, following these in-person public comments, just as a reminder uh, for folks. We do have another commenter virtually at the moment. So I will start with the in person, um, our first speaker, Ken, you're, you're welcome to come up and begin speaking. You'll have three minutes, um, and if you'd like, you can provide your name and address, but that is not required. Uh, and uh, yeah, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, you're ready. Thank you. Uh, th this is a fairly, uh, it's an old house. I think it's from the vintage uh, in the 40s and it's covered with uh, asbestos siding. And my concern is uh, in the destruction of this house that they, they not liberate any asbestos into the community, into the neighborhood. We have a lot of children who, who live in the area. And uh, also some of, some of the siding has cracked off and maybe in the soil surrounding the house. So they need to be very careful how that's removed and remediated. And I just wanna make the, the the, the commission aware here that it it appears that the siding uh, on this on the on the old house that they're going to tear down is is of the asbestos type. So I just just want you guys to assure us that you're going to make sure that they they don't just knock it down with a bulldozer or whatever, and that'll create a lot of dust. This stuff is very brittle. It's uh, with time, it just cracks and it, and it turns to dust and gets in the air. So that's very concerned. I'm, I'm not concerned uh, as much about what they're going to build. That's more the neighbor who lives next door. She'll discuss those issues with you. 
but I, I just want to make sure that you uh, they do a clean, clean job in removing the old uh, building that's there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Thank you for your comment. Um, our next commenter is uh, Phil in person uh, and Liz. Um, you uh, yes, you're welcome to come up, Liz, and you can speak. You'll have three minutes, and um, also um, you'll uh, if you could provide your name and address, that's welcome but not required. Thank you. Hi. So um, Phil, Philippe and I live um, right next door um, to this unit, and we do have a number of concerns that we wanted to raise. Um, one of them was um, partially addressed about the tree. There are two enormous um, Douglas fir trees where the arborist did not I believe um, really address the health of these trees um, about how old they are and how long they normally live. Um, I have understood from um, a previous speaker that they can live up to 80 or 90 years. And so it is possible that they're reaching the end of their um, lifespans because of how tall they are. And we're concerned about the health of those trees, um, whether or not they're invested. We don't know anything about it, but what, what we do know is that with the excavation um, where, and with the stress um, from drought and from atmospheric rivers, we are very concerned about the possibility of these trees um, possibly toppling and they are of such a height that they would not only topple over the new construction but over our house as well. So um, we uh, have also noted that this is a substandard lot and so uh, in terms of width and so we've noticed that the um, construction, the project is um, to put the house all the way up to the maximum of what you can uh, against where our property is and um, that does limit our privacy, it, it re um, reduces our light and so um, I noticed that there isn't any real possibility with the property um, uh, in the front um, of uh, putting um, there was no proposal about putting any privacy hedges or anything because it really is right up against um, our property and so it, uh, it is a concern. I did notice that they did um, reduce the um, height of the windows um, uh, that are directly on our side and I would ask that the second property in the back would also have that kind of raised height um, because there is one window that looks um, directly on to um, the bottom edge of our, our property in the backside. And so it would be nice if we can in, at least um, guard some privacy that way. Um, the, uh, I also have a concern, um, uh, again, about asbestos and with the as excavation, um, because uh, we do have a very long property. Um, we are concerned about um, uh, the integrity of um, what happens when you dig, and also there's compaction and all that. And so, what will the um, what the, will the new um, owners do in order to make sure that they're safeguards to um, our our property because we don't want to have foundational issues, um, but also when when they dig. So and hold on one second. Your three minutes are up. Are are you giving your three minutes to her as as well? Yes, you can use my time. Yes. Okay. So yes. Can we set it again at three minutes, please? Okay. Thank okay, you. Okay. Sure. And so uh, we were concerned about um, how uh, when they dig up, you know, the the basement, um, whether or not they would be also, um, you know, kicking up any, you know, asbestos or other um, uh, health. Um, uh, hazards um, into the air and how they would be protecting um, us from that kind of uh, eventuality since we're anticipating a, an enormous amount of uh, dust and dirt um, all over including our windows and window screens and things like that. So I, we just wanted to make sure that, that these kinds of concerns are addressed and we are concerned about privacy. Um, we would like to have that back window, um, uh, uh, you know, be less invasive um, in that back property. Um, and then uh, also to uh, address the fact that because it is a smaller property, it, everything really is right up against to where we are. Um, it would have been nice, you know, if 
if in an ideal world, if we didn't have those Douglas fir trees, that they would have flipped the whole property. And there was ample room. Um, I've noticed when we walk in the neighborhood, there usually is um, bigger distances between tall properties. Um, and it, it would have been nice to have a little bit of space between us and, and our neighbors. It doesn't look like they're, they're uh, allowing for any of that. And um, it looks like the trees, when I spoke with the neighbor um, uh, who was building the project, she, she had said it was because of the Douglas fir trees. But I, uh, I am concerned that n nobody seems to talk about the health of those trees and also the age of those trees and their longevity and, and their um, eventual demise. Okay, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Oh, I also wanted to say transformers. Um, our neighbor uh, who just spoke um, said that uh, PG&E um, had issues with transformers. Since we have all these big properties that use a lot of electricity for heating and um, air conditioning, um, I'm concerned that um, our electricity will go out because there are other constructions in, um, in, that are part of the block that we belong to um, that are across the street and also next to us. And so they are um, um, buildings that take more electricity. So I just wanted to know whether or not there were plans um, to at least address the additional um, electricity usage and the demands and to make sure that I don't have to wait until there was a power outage before a transformer was changed or whatever is necessary for electricity be to meet the demands of the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there other commenters? At this time I see one hand raised virtually so I can have okay. them. Okay, you know, before we go to that, mm -hmm. um, I am also noticing that it is 1055 and we are obliged to quit at 11 unless we um, have a motion to continue a little bit later. Um, I would um, entertain a motion of going maybe at, till 1115 if we think we might be able to finish by then, but I also would be interested in any other motions that um, anyone from the commission would have or if somebody's got a hard stop at 11. I can go till 1115. I also can stay until 11.15. I'm happy to make a motion that we continue meeting until 11.15. Thank you. Could I have a second? Second. Okay, we're going to vote. Um, Commissioner Barnes? Yes. Commissioner Doe? Yes. Commissioner Riggs? Yes. Commissioner Schindler? Yes. Commissioner Tate? Yes. Okay, and I'm also a yes. So we will continue until um, we will we'll get this done by 11.15. Um, so yes, can we move on to the next caller? Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris. We have Anna um, on the line. I'm going to allow you to speak. You'll have three minutes. Thank you very much. Hello, Commissioners. My name is Anna. I'm a neighbor at 810 Partridge. I'll make my comments as brief and direct as possible. Thank you for uh, extending the meeting so I could speak. Last year, the members of this planning commission approved a very similar project next door to my home, where a developer purchased a substandard lot, obtained an exemption, and squeezed as much farmhouse style dwelling onto it as possible with very little yard space. That application's arborist report required that excavation of the ground next to a heritage tree on our property be done by hand or small mechanical excavation according to specific guidelines so as not to destroy the tree's root system. The morning of the excavation, I was interrupted from my work by the sound of heavy machinery making a violent ripping noise. When I looked out the window, an unfamiliar laborer was using a large machine that looked and sounded like a cross between a jackhammer and a chainsaw to quite literally tear through the root system of the heritage tree on our property. Hoping to stop the damage, our texts to the developers were ignored, and so we called code enforcement as well as the planning commission but got answering machines. Our emails went, also went unanswered until it was too late. So I got to listen as the heritage tree's root system was badly and irreversibly damaged. In another incident, the developer's heavy ground compacting machinery violated local noise limits and shook the ground so much that there was visible damage to both our neighbor's home and our own. That day, the developer denied our concerns, so again we called code enforcement and the planning commission hoping to stop the damage. 
No one responded to our emails or phone calls. We called the police, but they couldn't help because the compacting had ended by the time they arrived. My concern with the current project is that these developers are being allowed to squeeze square footage into substandard lots without sufficient oversight or regulation. These standards mean nothing if they are not enforced. This entire process becomes a charade. I took a quick look at this application and accompanying, accompanying reports and did not see the asbestos issue mentioned. If the existing home does indeed contain asbestos, there are vulnerable, vulnerable populations all around this lot including the elderly, as a low-income housing complex for the elderly exists directly next door, and there are children all up and down the street. Therefore, I formally dispute the approval of this project and respectfully request that this application require that the developer in the city designate a contact with appropriate authority who may be reached by phone or email during construction hours for actual oversight and enforcement, that the developer provide additional details and enforceable safeguards to address the citizen concerns set forth in this meeting, especially the asbestos, and that the city impose and actually enforce larger fines for noncompliance in this application, as well as others. There's simply not enough oversight or enforcement to allow these non-resident developers to proceed with these non-standard profit-driven projects that damage the homes and neighborhoods in, with, in which the city of Menlo Park's constituents reside. Thank you. Thank you. Are there uh, um, are there other commenters? I do not see any other commenters or hands raised at this time. Okay, terrific. Um, so let's bring it back to the dais. Um, so a number of items were brought up, and I'm hopeful that we can address a few of them um, in the short time we have left. Is there? Uh, do I have any commissioners who wish to speak on this item? Uh, Commissioner Schindler. Thank you. Um, through the chair, could, could the staff could staff please address the standard processes as it relates to asbestos detection, removal, and monitoring? Uh, as this is something that is uh, referenced, I think, in the staff report that there's some preliminary testing that's been done. There's reference to what would be happen in the future, but I'd like a little bit more detail about what the official governing practices are. Thank you. Uh, in regards to asbestos, that's not something that we look at through the entitlement process, through the planning case that we're reviewing right now. However, with that being said, as the applicants submit for a building permit, that's when we get into the details of uh, the demolition. Uh, in this case, if it were to be, which it is, to be demoed if uh, asbestos is of concern and if it is caught that the property does indeed have asbestos, then the applicant is required to immediately notify Bay Area Air Quality Management and through them do a remediation. So it's all done through the building permit process and not through the planning permit, which is why uh, it's, it has not been elaborated in the staff report. Um, and similarly, could you please, um, for my benefit, remind me of the process for and and when the process and the mechanisms and the responsible organizations for the regulation and monitoring of excavations that too is looked at in great detail during the building permit process structural engineers are involved and structural calculations and other documentations pertaining to uh, the structure of the proposed buildings are submitted to the building division for their compliance review uh, as well as shoring details and uh, other information that pertain to light well excavation and its proposal uh, it's during that time that it is ensured that there's no negative impact to the surrounding neighbors. Thank you. So that's detail that's helpful to understand in the assessment phase. Um, I'm unfamiliar with all of the, with the nuances of the enforcement side of that. Could you give me sort of some of the highlights? If there are, so for example, if there are guidelines to be set about how excavation is to be done, um, what is, what ensures that that happens? Uh, 
as mentioned, through the building permit process, this is when uh, a detailed review is conducted of all the documentations and plans that are submitted in regards to the proposal. In addition to that, we have building inspectors that go out and monitor all the construction phases of any projects. Uh, they will look at it carefully in regards to what was submitted, uh, what is in compliance and what is not. And if there's anything that it appears to be out of compliance, the work will be stopped and brought back for review uh, in front of the building division. Thank you. Okay, other commissioners who wish to comment on uh, this item? Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Thank you. Um, through the chair, um, I have a couple of additional questions for staff. Um, one specifically regarding the Arborist report. Um, that I believe does <clears throat> address the um, Douglas firs that are uh, by the property line. Can you just confirm that? The new condition of approval that was read out at the beginning of the item would help uh, with your question, I believe. All right, so were, uh, were the two Douglas fir trees included in the arborist survey they were included in the arborist survey and as well as in the arborist report but very briefly ah okay so that will be augmented is that correct that report will be augmented correct all right thank you thank you um and then there was also a concern i i I know the answer, but it's appropriate, I believe, that I ask um, staff in this case, um, who's concerned about uh, electrical power for increased loads in the neighborhood. I Do believe you... I'm unable to answer that question. In that case, um, I I'll be so bold as to. Could you please, yes, could you please answer your own question I'll, for I'll, us? Thank I'll, you. I'll share my personal experience, both as an applicant and as an architect, that um, there will be no additional loads uh, in your neighborhood until PG&E goes through a truly extensive process of evaluating the loads and upgrading the transformers and making sure that they get paid in four to five figures. Uh, prior to doing that work. Um, they will also most likely um, delay the project by at least six months in their process of doing it, but uh, they, will, they will make sure uh, that the power is available before anyone can um, uh, hook into it. Um, and um, so uh, I, I don't want to cut short any comments by other commissioners, but I am prepared to make a uh, motion. Um, yeah. So I think you go ahead and make the motion. If other commissioners want to speak, they can do that. So I'll move to approve the use permit um, per the staff report. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Riggs. Does anybody either want to make a second or have additional comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner Barnes. Thank you for that. I will uh, also abstain on this item. I think the discretionary use process is um, unfair uh, and is currently doesn't, doesn't function. So for that reason, I'll be abstaining as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, do we have a second for this motion? I'm happy to second. Okay. We have a second. We've got a first um, from Commissioner Riggs and a second from Commissioner Schindler. 
So we're going to take a vote, um, unless I hear from any other commissioners, which is not. Um, okay, so Commissioner uh, Barnes. Thank you, abstention. Okay, Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Riggs. Yes. Commissioner Schindler. Yes. Commissioner Tate. Yes. Okay, and I'm also a yes. So we have five uh, in favor and one abstention um, for this item. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I just want to confirm that the motion included the condition uh, that Ms. Kahn read um, as an addition to the staff report. My apologies, yes. Okay, thank uh, you. Yes, okay. okay. So that closes out item, um, agenda item G, and we're gonna move on to H, which is informational items. Um, future planning commission meeting schedule. Um, could we hear from Ms. Sandmeyer of uh, there's any other uh, additions that you would like to discuss? And if you could give us a sense, as much as you know it to date, of what, what will be coming on February 27th and March 13th. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, the February 27th meeting is in three weeks, so we haven't finalized the agenda um, or sent out the notice. We have a couple of single family homes that we're preliminarily looking at um, for putting on this agenda. Um, but yes, uh, it's not, we don't have confirmation of the agenda yet, and then, um, also for March 13th, that's farther away and um, that has not been finalized either. Okay, any other questions for Ms. Sandmeyer before we adjourn? Okay, um, then I will adjourn this meeting um, at 1110. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good night. <laughs>